Hey, how's it going? I'm Captain Cody Gondek, 34th Bomb Squadron. We're here at Ellsworth Air Force Base today in a hangar outside of the 34th Bomb Squadron, and uh, we're going to show you around a B-1. So you can see here the whisker looking thing that's called the SMUX. It's the Structural Mode Control System. Uh, it helps the aircraft when flying low altitude. Since the aircraft is so long, uh, it basically acts as a moment arm and flies the nose of the aircraft to keep it up with the aft end. So uh, if you can imagine when we're going low and fast, it's a lot of turbulence. So keeping that, uh, keeping the nose and the tail kind of in stride really helps with the integrity of the backbone of the aircraft. Um, so the smucks, as we call it, the, uh, it can have up to 200 revolutions or 200 degrees per second uh, while flying low. So it's basically just a wing that's moving really quick uh, up and down just so that the nose, the body of the aircraft doesn't get that much fatigue. We've got the radome up front. So inside the radome, we've got a radar antenna that can look left, right, and forward. Helps the B-1 with low altitude. The B-1 can fly down low by itself, down to 200 feet off the ground. Uh, and that's heavily dependent on this radar that we have equipped with the aircraft. Moving to the right side, you can see we've got the other three pitot static tubes there and the right side of the smucks that we talked about earlier. So inside the nose gear as well, we've got our ladder control. So we can have the ladder locked, unlocked, and then to gravity extend. So just without using any sort of uh, electrical power, we can have the ladder, ladder come down via gravity uh, using that switch. Also the crew chiefs, um, we usually have one crew chief with us with the assistant as well. We'll have the crew chief plugged into a comm cord that is right on the landing gear here. And then they also control the main landing gear, uh, main landing gear doors for us. So once we get up on power, we'll close the stores bay doors and then the chief will come and close the main landing gear doors. The ladder going up to the cockpit, we'll get there later, um, but it's roughly 17 feet up. And then we got our secure radios and some fuel servicing areas on the right hand side that we check before we get into the cockpit as well. For the sniper targeting pod, it's right here. Uh, we've got infrared and television capabilities. Um, we just make sure that the glass here is clean and free of any cracks. The stores bays, which is kind of the biggest part about the B1. So we've got three stores bays, the forward, intermediate, and aft. This one currently is holding a bay tank, which, is allow, which allows us to carry an additional 20,000 pounds of fuel. These bays are currently at uh, part way open. So you, they can open up, up about another 45 degrees so that it can be fully open. Each stores bay can hold up to eight GBU-31s, or uh, eight LRASM, or eight JASM. Um, so that's 16,000 pounds of weapons per bay, which a typical loadout is gonna be three full bays of 2,000 pound weapons. Uh, so we're looking at 48,000 pounds of bombs. Or if we're flying long distances where uh, we're going from air refueling to air refueling, we usually throw in one of these storage bay tanks to make sure that we have enough gas to get where we need to go. The storage bay tank adds about 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes extra uh, distance for us between having to refuel or land and get more gas. The B-1 can carry three conventional rotary launchers, which we call CRLs. It's kind of like a uh, pistol revolver. So you put a weapon in each station, it's got eight stations, and it'll rotate from station to station to get the weapons off the aircraft. Each rotation takes four and a half seconds so from one to two is four and a half seconds. Another potential for us to carry is a 10 carry. So that's gonna be 10 500 pound weapons and then a 28 carry, which is 28 500 pound weapons as well. And those can go in any of these three bays that we have. If we want to open the weapons bay doors from inside, um, they can all be open, but it would go forward and then intermediate and aft. So there's a little bit delay between opening them all. Um, but it's pretty quick to open. I'd say it's uh, called three or four seconds for all the stores bay's doors to open. And then we can command them to be open to part or full. 
So we've got that uh, capability inside of how we want to choose the weapons. If we're releasing a single weapon, port part might be the best way to go. But if we're releasing using a 28 carry and we've got 28 500 pound weapons, the doors are gonna be all the way to full. So inside the jet, flying in the low 20,000s of feet, you feel the stores bay come down and then the doors open. It's, uh, you can notice that there's a little bit more drag on the aircraft and you can hear it, but it really doesn't affect performance all that much. And then honestly, when we're releasing weapons, you got a 2,000 pound bomb come off the uh, aircraft. It kind of just feels like you're running over a squirrel on the road. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty not significant for how heavy the weapons that come off the jet can be. So walking around, uh, we've got engines one and two on the left-hand side and three and four on the right-hand side. So this jet just got washed. So the slats and flaps are currently down. Usually when we get to the aircraft, the slats and flaps are retracted. Um, but you can see the wing glove lights. So with the B1, the wing sweep makes it kind of look uh, not like a regular airplane. So once the wings are aft of 20 degrees, these wing glove lights will turn on and that's just the normal uh, left and right red and green lights for our aircraft. It's especially significant for when the wings are fully aft uh, because those are gonna be the most prominent points on the aircraft where the lights are seen. The slats uh, for the airspeed that we can use them at, it's below 346, 340 knots or 0.6 Mach, which is pretty quick uh, while we're flying. Looks a little weird with the hydro bucket attached to the wing here, but uh, I talked about the hydraulic system a little bit earlier. We've got four different hydraulic systems. Systems one and four can hold up to 12 gallons of hydraulic fluid, and two and three can hold up to 20. See, up to 64 gallons of uh, hydraulic fluid. So that's a lot of fluid that can leak out of the aircraft. So this is just a precautionary. They put a bucket with a hose on it to catch some of the hydraulic fluid that's gonna leak. Uh, Non-standard as well, most airplanes are hydraulically pressured to 3,400 PSI. The B1 is pressured up to 4,000 PSI. Um, so it's just a higher pressure with a lot of hydraulic fluid as well. So the next kind of noticeable thing here is the static dissipators. So there's three on the side and then we've got six on the trailing edge of the wing. Uh, that is just does exactly how its name is just to get static away from the aircraft uh, while we're flying We also have the fuel vents one on each wing So if we need to dump fuel, that's where it's going to come from If we need to dump fuel one of the reasons uh, our max takeoff weight is 470,000 pounds But our max landing weight is 346,500 pounds. So if we take off extremely heavy and let's say we have an emergency where we have to shut an engine down and we want to come back and land we'd have to either burn the gas or dump it in order to be at a safe landing weight that we can safely land the aircraft uh, in order or in accordance with like structural integrity but also if you're landing an aircraft that's 340,000 pounds that's going to take up 10 to 12,000 feet of runway so fortunately here at Ellsworth our runway is about 13,500 feet um, but it takes a lot of runway to slow down, especially when we're heavyweight. So here you can see uh, we've got the flaps down and the spoilers extended. The B1 has spoiler ons, so if we need to turn, those spoiler ons that you see will go up. They also act as speed brakes for us, and once the speed brakes are fully attracted, we still have about 15 degrees of uh, authority. So even if the speed brakes are fully out and that's our, the spoiler ons are our method of turning left or right, with the speed brakes fully extended, we can still, we still have enough flight control authority in order to move the jet. A little non-standard with the B1 compared to other aircraft. So we take off with the slats fully extended and the flaps fully down. So it's not like a traditional airliner where they have like a takeoff setting and a landing setting. We are always taking off with the flaps fully down. Typical takeoff speed. Um, so today, Mr. Bolton took off. They were probably around 149 knots. 
uh, which is their rotate, and then takeoff speed is 15 knots ahead of that. So if rotate's 149, takeoff's gonna be 164. Say we're landing at 270,000 pounds, our landing speed is gonna be around 160 knots. If for whatever reason we have to land no flap, so it'd be slats retracted and flaps up, our no flap speeds are in excess of 200 knots. So even if we're like 280,000 pounds, which is relatively lightweight for the B1, our no flap speed is gonna be in the 195 to 205 region, which once again, takes a lot of runway in order to slow us down. So here's actually a good view. You can see the overwing fairing, which is the black uh, mesh area above the engines. The overwing fairing is the area that the wings slide into once they're uh, once we decide to move the wings. So we can take off in 15 or 20 wing, we cruise in 25 wing, and then uh, normal flight, flight profile, so we're flying at 25 wing, we'll employ weapons at uh, either 25, 45, 55, or 67.5 wing. Um, and all that means is that, so the wing right now is currently at 15 degrees, if it's coming back to 67.5, the wing would probably be back here somewhere and the wing root area would go into the black overwing fairing area um, it's just an area that the the wing goes to when it's swept so when we uh, when we sweep the wings um, the max g that we can have while sweeping the wings is only 1.4 we have to be pretty cautious while sweeping the wings to not exceed that 1.4 g limit because uh, it's definitely a lot of stress on the aircraft when the wings are sweeping also, it's uh, imperative that we get those wings forward to have the slower landing speeds that we're really looking for with such a heavy airplane. Uh, so some of the panels here, we've got fire bottles. So a fire bottle for uh, if we get an engine fire, as well as the top one for the overwing fairing. So we've got a main and reserve system. Uh, we just, during our walk rounds, we check to make sure that those are pressurized. And then for maintenance, they can control the overing fairing using the switch over here as well. So we can command it up, down, or flight. And in flight mode uh, is usually, is how we employ the aircraft. So you can kind of see the business end of the aircraft, the uh, four afterburners. Um, the nozzles are uh, oil actuated, so when we go to take off, we hit the mill power, you'll see the nozzles collapse, so they'll tighten, and then once we light the afterburner, the nozzles will expand and get that full uh, fuel flow, kind of keep the temperature down for the engines with the afterburner. So on each uh, nacelle, we've got an APU. So this is going to be our right APU, and that's the ventilation area for the APU. We'll start the aircraft by turning the left and right APU on. We will couple it up and then turn on our number two and number four generator. Once the number two and four generator are coupled, then we're good to start. Uh, we'll start engines two and four first with the APU running. Uh, starting engines two and four, once they get spun up, those engines take over power for running the generators, and then the APUs are still used for the bleed air system in order to start engines one and three. We can also start, uh, for whatever reason, if we can't get number three started and we have four started, we can use the number four engine to provide bleed air to number three in order to start the engine. And then another option is if we've got three and four started and we let's say our left APU is broken, we can cross bleed the air through the jet in order to get enough air to the left side of the jet to start engines one and two. The gear is very strong. Max landing weight, 346,500 pounds, um, and they definitely take a beating. The gear cycle for, uh, as soon as we put the gear handle up switch, it can take as long as 37 seconds in like cold weather. Um, I tell you 37 seconds is a long time. Uh, you get a little impatient during that, but it's normally normally quicker than that. I would say it normally takes maybe 10 to 15 seconds. We can uh, put the gear down at below 280 or 0.6 Mach. And then uh, if for whatever reason we need to alter extend the gear, 
So if we don't have hydraulic power, we still have got a way to put the gear down via gravity, and that's gonna have to happen below 240 knots. So we'll slow down in that case to called 234 knots. We'll put the gear down using the Alter uh, gear handle, and then the gear should just fall via gravity in order to uh, safely land. We do have systems inside the aircraft that can uh, tell us when the gear is down and locked. If we're getting signs in the front that uh, we've got an abnormal gear indication, we can have the WISOs in the back check to see if the gear is down and locked, which is a, a benefit of the jet system itself. So there's a lot of tubing up there. Um, both of those, so we had a tube in the aft and the forward sector. Those are both uh, environmental control systems. So big aircraft with a lot of different systems, but we use the environmental control system to keep these stores cool. So each bomb bay is uh, kept at a certain temperature in order to make sure the bombs work correctly. For the tail of the aircraft, so to start off, you can see the hole, and that's on both sides of the aircraft. That's actually a fuel venting hole. So if we have excess fuel for whatever reason, it can vent out of there. One good reason for that is if we're air fueling to our to the most we can take. So we've got a storage bay tank. We can take up to 205,000 pounds of gas. Uh, if we're hanging on the tanker with all of our lives, making sure we can get all the gas to get home, one surefire way of knowing that we've got full gas tanks is that the tankers or the other jet that you're flying with can see fuel venting out of there and that's like we can't take any more gas we're 100 percent full so with the horizontal stabilizer um, we talked about the wings sweeping back to 67.5 degrees if we are going above supersonic the horizontal stab has a lot more authority just by sheer size of it so that's when the spoiler ons are not going to have authority to be able to roll the jet so the horizontal stabulator can act as the wings of the aircraft. So if you want to turn right, you'll see the stab split. So the right will be up and the left will be down and that'll actually roll the aircraft to the right. So right here you can see the vortex generators. Um, they help increase airflow underneath the lower rudder, which is just aft of those. If we're missing one out of the top uh, seven there, we're reduced to 0.85 Mach, and if we're missing two, we're reduced to 0.8 Mach. So obviously they are a pretty big deal, uh, seemingly small, but a pretty big deal to the overall aircraft um, speed and structural limitations. So when we first do our flight control check, you'll see all rudder, or just the top rudder go left if we're pushing left on the rudder. And then we'll push right on the rudder, you'll see the top go right, and that lower rudder will stay uh, straight. Once we turn on our SCAS servos, they will all be connected so that you'll see if we push the rudder to the left, all rudders from the back here will go left and then all right. Also, if we use the controls, uh, if we push the stick to the left, you'll see that lower rudder move to the left as well. So it really helps with the um, roll authority of the aircraft, especially low altitude. We've got our entire defensive avionics suite. So you can see kind of the two pods in the back here, and that's referred to our ALQ-161. It's the B1's way of defending itself. So we have a crew member, the uh, defensive systems operator, whose full duty on the aircraft is defense. So they'll get all the signals in the back. Uh, we can tell if stuff's looking at us or shooting at us. Uh, one of the first things we're taught when we're, you know, learning to fly the B-1 on takeoff, uh, we hit that 146 rotate speed, pull back on the stiff stick. Uh, you cannot go more than 10 degrees nose high, otherwise you can get a tail strike. And then on landing, uh, that's going to be 9 AOA. So from this angle, if you see the EL, the L in Ellsworth, just to the aft of that L is gonna be the upper rudder. And then down below the stab is our lower rudder. Like I talked about, a lot of fuel on this aircraft. Um, we've got one, two, three, and four, and then both wings, and then we have two main tanks. Each main tank can hold 10,000 pounds of fuel, so you've got 20,000 in your main tanks. The wings can hold about 16,000 pounds, uh, so each wing. So we always have our tanks pumping to the mains, and the mains are the main supplier of gas. Um, but 
especially with weapons, we use the tanks one and four as um, it helps with our center of gravity. So let's say we were gonna drop 28 500 pound bombs out of the aft uh, stores bay. Fuel system, which is called FIGMS, the Fuel Center of Gravity Management System, will know that we're gonna release those stores and it'll start pumping fuel aft in order to account for the weapons that we're gonna release from the aft. So that can get kind of weird with center of gravity uh, restrictions because if we pump the fuel aft and then for whatever reason we don't release the weapons, then we have a really far aft center of gravity, which could be a problem while we fly. So here you can see, I was talking about the overwing fairing earlier, you can see kind of scuff marks on the wing here. So if the wings are sweeping aft, you can see a good, a good portion of the wing will go get tucked inside of that overwing fairing area. So when we go to take off, the uh, first thing we'll do is we'll go to mill power, holding the brakes. So mill power is the maximum amount of thrust that the engines produce without afterburner. So we'll put the throttles, all four, into mill. Uh, make sure the engines stabilize. Once they're stabilized, we'll go into minimum afterburner. So there's a little detent, we call it going over the hump. We go over the hump and we'll get four green lights in our cockpit that show that the afterburner is lit. And once we get all four of those uh, confirming that the afterburner is lit, then we'll go to maximum after afterburner and uh, we'll release brakes. Um, so when we, let's see, once we go to maximum afterburner power, um, our fuel flow increases to around 252, 256,000 pounds per hour. So a typical takeoff in the B1 going from um, ground level to call it flight level 200, you can expect us to burn about 12,000 pounds of gas. When we're cruising around, uh, our typical cruise speed is 0.72 Mach, and depending on our gross weight, uh, we'll, we'll burn about 16 to 20,000 pounds per hour just cruising. Uh, we've got four engines. At idle, you can expect to see 4,000 pounds per hour, so it's about 1,000 pounds per engine. In military power, you'd expect to see probably around 34,000 pounds per hour, and then once we go to maximum afterburner, that's when you'll see the over 250,000 pounds per hour. We've got a lot of fuel on board, though, so uh, in general, with a fuel full tank of gas, we can, we can go supersonic for 15 to 30 minutes, uh, especially when we're out at Nellis, participating in red flags. We can spend a lot of that time supersonic. If you don't go, so what's, what's the longest hourly endurance? So our max endure is going to be four AOA. Um, you can see between twelve and fourteen thousand pounds per hour uh, at max endure, but that's going pretty slow for us. That's probably in the two fifty to two hundred eighty knots kind of range. So. We gotta be really looking to spend some time in the air to be going that slow. Like I said, we like to cruise around at 0.72 Mach, so anything below the 0.72, if we're max enduring at four AOA, that's gonna be around the 0.5 to 0.6 Mach kind of area. Four um, AOA, is that in time? Yes, okay. yeah, yep. It's actually four plus 0.1 for every 20K above 320, but so just aft of the pilot area, on top of the jet is going to be where our chaff and flare go. Um, so we've got a, a multitude amount of chaff and flare that we can carry. Um, I don't think I should say the actual numbers of like what we can carry. Um, but if you see us use chaff or flare, it's going to come from on top of the jet and it'll get dispersed uh, as it travels aft of the airplane over the vertical stabulator. So up front here, um, this is tail 129 named the Black Widow. It's also Ellsworth OG flagship jet. That's why we got both squadrons on it, uh, with the 34th being the better of the two squadrons. We've got the rescue area, so for whatever reason, if we can't get the ladder down and emergency crews need to reach into the cockpit area, um, they've got a hatch pool there, which would blow the top hatch off the aircraft so they can get to us from above. Right between the two squadrons, you can see a little window. Uh, the Wizzos like to call it their day-night indicator, and that's their view from the back outside, uh, as opposed to the pilot's view up front. We've got 
quite a bit of window space up front, uh, but the Wizzos, I can really only tell if it's like day or night outside. Um, they're basically just, they sit, they sit like two feet above that. So if they're looking outside, it's kind of hard. They gotta hunch over and kind of look down. So it's tough for them. Hi, I'm Captain Mary Massatelli. Uh, I'm a Wizzo on the B1. Uh, well, today we're going to go around the exterior. Uh, one of our pilots have already done that, so I will try to walk through what is more specific to our uh, mission set on what we're doing on our crew station. We can start in the aft real quick. Uh, if we swing around back here, uh, you can see this is our TWIF, uh, which is our tail warning function system. That is going to be housing a lot of our different antennas for our DAS, which is our defensive avionics. It's going to be a uh, pretty robust electronic suite that we have. Uh, you'll also see up towards the top by the tail, there is also another housing there for the antenna uh, right there. Over here we have uh, the housings for our ALE-50, which is our tow decoy system. We're going to have four on each side, so a total of eight we can carry. And right now you just see those covers in there. When we have the actual decoys in there, they'll be able to actually to see the individual housings. Uh, not going to belabor a lot uh, when you talk about the exterior here, because I saw the pilot was covering down a lot of it. If we actually walk this way, we can walk underneath to our bays. Comparative to our other uh, bombers in the fleets, we have three bays. This is our aft bay. We could load up uh, our different modular launchers. So we have a 28 carry for conventional bombs. We have a 10 carry, and then we'll have our uh, rotary launcher, which will carry eight. And we have a uh, one for JDAM, and we have one for JASM. The difference between those two is there's block stores for the CRL that covers the JDAM, the Joint Direct. Uh, the Joint Direct Attack Munition. Uh, with that one, like I said, their inner stations are blocked, the outer stations are open. So there's a rotation time with that. Uh, we don't have any in here currently. Those ones themselves would uh, rotate four and a half seconds between. So what you're looking there, we could release in a 31 and a half seconds, would be about five weapons per bay, which that would mean within three bays we were fully loaded up we would be able to release 15 weapons in that amount of time. Looking at as far as what we have, as far as the largest uh, payload the Air Force can offer, we could have 24 JDAM. Those are 2,000 pound bombs. Uh, in reference to that, that's about the weight of like a VW bug. Uh, or you could also base it off of uh, like a, the Liberty Bell. That's a, about a ton, so let freedom ring. Uh, if you go down this way, let's walk to the other one. This one you can give a clear look to at the weapons base spoiler. So that little grate right there, when we open up the doors to break up the airflow and create a safe, uh, safe separation between the weapon and the jet, that'll drop down and that'll allow us to release those weapons. And as the doors close, it will rise itself. Back here, you can kind of see some of the uh, torque tubes. Uh, I'm sure some of our maintenance individuals will be able to talk to that, but those are gonna operate the, the slats, the flaps, and the uh, wings there, the larger tube. Obviously being a variable wing, aircraft will be able to adjust those. We have to have that kind of running through. You also see all the wiring that's running through. We have a lot of redundant systems and we could talk to a lot about that. We get inside to those panels, but we have a lot of wiring that's running through this aircraft. You can kind of see how it's been built over the years, kind of going through 70s technology to 80s, 90s, 2000s. We just keep adapting. It's one of the, you know, the best parts about the B-1. No matter what mission set we're given, we excel at it. Flexibility uh, is the key to air power, as they say, and we are very well uh, equipped to do that. Between going through the different loadouts, so I already said the JDAM carries, but we also have we have the 28 carries in there, so we call them the dumb bombs. Uh, those are your Mark 82s. Those ones, we carry 28 in each, so that's 84 total. We don't carry those as much anymore because we prefer the bang for the buck, which is GPS-guided weapons. 
but uh, we also st uh, st do really well when it comes to the standoff munitions, so carrying the 24 by uh, JASM or your joint air-to-surface standoff munition uh, missile, my apologies. Uh, that one is going to give us the flexibility to be able to take out a lot more strategic targets from a further distance to keep us away from a lot of those threats. Um, we are some of the best at planning that weapon, employing that weapon, and we have uh, historical records of us being able to do so. Then we are also moving on, and we'll talk to it, but the, uh, the RASM is the future. That's our anti-ship missile, long-range anti-ship missile. And uh, that one pretty much is what we go out there for any uh, boat hunting, uh, if you would call it that. But that is going to be the future kind of steps as the B-1 goes and integrates in with the Navy, um, just becoming more lethal of a platform. We are the workhorse of the Air Force when it comes to dropping bombs. When they need somebody to get the job done, they call them the B-1. Uh, you see also that right now I could talk to the doors. The doors themselves, are right now we have part and full. This is part. So we have the rotary launcher. It only has to open the part to release the single weapon through this uh, opening. If you look here, you can see the, the gap in here. If we were going to full, you wouldn't be able to see that gap where that tube is right there. This would swing completely open. And then this would be able to operate for when we have those 10 carries and we're dropping some of the smaller bombs. So we could also carry uh, 30 WIC mids. Those are the weapon uh, controlled munitions there. And then those would be like the CBU 103s, the CBU 104s and 105s. The 103s are your bomblets. They open up and throw a bunch of little bombs everywhere. Um, then you're gonna have your 104s or your mines. We don't really utilize those anymore, but those for like anti-tank mines. And then uh, you have the 105s, which they open up these little skeet shooters and they actually create hot projectiles that they'll fling out and uh, go hunting for those vehicles as well. But then we'll also carry uh, GBU 38s, which is another JDAM. That's a 500 pound class bomb. And then we also carry uh, for the GBU 54, which as we walk up this way, I can show you the pod. That is your laser guided. Um, so we could add extra corrections into the system and we could also pull in our own coordinates with this pod, which kind of helps us depending on if we have a mover and we want to track all the way up until impact or if we want to just pull in those cords as a stationary target. So part of one of our workarounds that we'll check is we'll double check, make sure there's nothing uh, blocking the inlet there on the pod here, but right here is where we would insert um, a data recording device to actually get some of the feedback for what we're actually seeing during flight. That way we can replay it for debrief, for any reason to kind of learn from what we're doing, make us that much more lethal. Uh, we're also checking to make sure that it's mounted correctly, there's nothing loose, and then also we're checking uh, obviously to see that there's a clear uh, view of the pod out the front and there's no smears on that would be a really bad day to go out there and have a smeared pod when you're trying to look through it. Uh, it goes to TV and IR. What that means is we have the capabilities, obviously it's like the black and white uh, screen you would see, but the TV isn't like a true TV, but it is clear and it does get us to what we need to, to go drop our bombs and be a, a dynamic aircraft in that uh, regard. We're able to actually pull in our own coordinates and go strike. So when we're working with like JTACs on the ground, we are the weaponeering experts. They will pass us what these taskings are, right? And you have, you know, they might be in contact. So they have other things that they're worried about. So when those troops are in contact, they're looking at you to be like, we need this thing gone. 2,000 pound, uh, 2, pound bomb will get the job done. Sometimes, you know, depending on how close we're talking, you're gonna wanna use a smaller bomb. So having the ability to use different modular setups really aids us in being that lethal force. You also see that we carry a tank. Uh, this is just another way for us to uh, fly longer dur uh, duration flights. Gives us a little more flexibility as far as loiter time. Uh, and obviously that will add into the bigger picture of what we're able to do because with the wings being able to sweep forward, loiter for a lot longer, sipping on the gas. Then obviously we could pin them back and go supersonic. Not many bombers can do that. And uh, not many bombers can roll too, so take that for what it is. Those are the safety handles that helps uh, with the doors open so they don't shut, keeping us safe out here. We're doing our pre-flights when we're going in. You can see that the bomb bay is a lot up, like higher up than some of our other bombers. Uh, the B-52, you can kind of walk through the bay. This one, we'd have to have a ladder to get up and check for the fusing types. 
the lanyards, double checking that the uh, uh, all the weapons are actually loaded correctly, lanyard pins and all those things have been pulled, but ready to go is what we're going off with that. They also have it, uh, we don't have the rack in here, I would like to have shown it to you, but figure it has the ejector uh, pistons that are pretty much shooting the weapon out of the jet. So that's what's kind of giving that force to give that disconnect. The other things to talk about, we kind of talked about with the defensive stuff was in the back of the jet. But another portion here is we have the wing glove. You kind of see where there's this panel that's bolted on there. Again, not to go too into detail, but there are a bunch of different antennas we have set up in there that's aiding in our transmit and receive capabilities for us to process uh, the threats that we're going against, both ground and airborne. And uh, as the B1 has uh, for us for the WISOs, we are obviously dual qual with uh, the OSO DSO. You have to be able to process that information that the jet's going to be receiving. And when we get inside, I can show you more on the panels uh, pretty much to break out what we're looking at in there. But with, with that being said, you're doing the job of an EWO and then you get inside, you'll see we're doing the job of a navigator, we're doing the job of a weapon systems officer. We walk up to the front. So in the front, you can see where the nose cone is slightly different color. That's where the uh, radar is going to be housed. So we have a uh, synthetic aperture radar. It's going to be housed in there. And I'll show you inside when we look at where the RDU is living. That's going to kind of picture uh, the, the green screen type image coming back up. So it's one of the older uh, technologies we have on the B1. But it does give us the fidelity still needed to go ahead and generate targets from that and go ahead and target. So anything that's radar significant, we could pull up a map up to about a 0.2 nautical mile. And we could go ahead and target off of that. All right, now that we covered uh, the outside of the aircraft, we could go up and uh, check inside at the stations. And as we're going up the ladder, one thing to keep in mind, uh, I like to think that when the engineers developed the B-1, they wanted, uh, they were given the two criteria that it has to have a lot of bombs and has to have a lot of gas. That's the majority of the space that this aircraft is utilized for. When we get up there, you're gonna see that they thought, oh yeah, we have to put four other guys in this plane. So, watch how small this is. All righty. Now, as you come up the stairs, you can also see there's some uh, grabbing points here to kind of get yourself uh, a good handle on. Obviously, as you get in, some of the funnier things is you have yellow handles. Those are your ejection handles. They're in a very good place for you to grab yourself to get into the jet. You do not want to grab those as you're getting in. All right. All right, so now that we got into the uh, actual seats, you can see there's some handles here. As you're getting up, we were actually raised. So when you come up the ladder, the floor is right there. When the pilots get up on long durations, we're talking like 24 plus. Uh, my longest was about a 30 hour sortie. You don't really have a lot of room to move. Um, hopefully you're not a claustrophobic individual, but it's one of those things where you really take uh, appreciation for just this little aisle to stand up in. Once you climb up in the seat though, because we are a little bit raised up compared to where the pilots are sitting, you can see our, uh, the affectionately called day night indicator. This is our window to the outside world. Not exactly the best. Uh, I'm only about 5'11". For me to look out of it, you're probably gonna get, you know, a neck problem with that. Uh, this is where we store a lot of our other mission set products, pens, pencils. Don't want those to interact with the ejection seat sequence there. You can see, uh, as you could break it out here, uh, these are the ACES seats. What would happen on an ejection sequence, the seat itself would, on the rails that were on, slide back, and then we would go out through these hatches. These are also manual hatches, so if we wanted to, let's say we couldn't get out the, the primary, which was going back down the ladder, we would have to go out through the hatch. We are, these are preferred because we could actually press in the detent, open these hatches up. Now they are very heavy, so it's a reminder to actually push them all the way open when you're getting out of them. And then we have uh, escape rope here. 
So there's a, an escape rope that we would have to feed out and then literally climb down a rope to get out of the jet if we couldn't get out of this hatch first. Then of course there's always the ejecting, um, but probably want to go down the ladder first in my opinion. Uh, over here, we have these big map cases. So you can store a lot of equipment and stuff in here for your mission. Uh, a lot of guys end up holding their lunches in there. <laughs> With that being said, as you work back this way, you can see lots of circuit breakers all around the jet. So with the B1, we have the EMUX, which is your electrical multiplex system. There's two systems that are running uh, together where one fails, the other one kind of picks up and tests against it. A lot of redundancy built in here so that we don't lose that electrical power and uh, keep a lot of the main systems we need to land safely if there were any issues with the jet. But you'll see then circuit breakers are everywhere. So we got circuit breakers over here. We'll explain the circuit breakers over there. And then in the back, we'll explain where most of the circuit breakers are living in the uh, cab back there. We have the jettison handle over here for uh, blowing out the hatch if you needed to. Right there is where that's gonna live. We have an oxygen knob here. This is how you're gonna turn on your oxygen flow. If you don't turn that knob on and you have your mask on and you're wondering why you're suffocating, you probably never flip that switch is probably what's going on. Uh, mode controls are over here for your seat adjustment and also for the ejection mode. So we have auto and man, pretty much Auto would be if another individual is set to auto as well and they pull their handles, we have the ejection sequence that goes from the aft station first and then goes up to the pilot seats. Uh, that offers us the uh, capabilities that if they're seeing something up front, obviously you can see we don't have very much uh, SA per se of where we are sometimes. Uh, they are able to back us up and they can pull their handles in a uh, terminal phase flight and get us out of the jet safely. Then you get over here, this is our cursor controller. So this is how we interface in with most of the systems in our jet. This is how we connect to the targeting pod. This is how we connect to the radar. This is how we also function in with all of our new MFDs. So I'll pull down my handy table here. This offers us the ability to have obviously our mission paperwork on it, but it also gives us uh, the space to kind of work what we need to, because the pilots are doing a lot of their flying. You could see right now, we have a lot of maintenance of systems, like I was already saying, where the navigator, we're the weapon systems officer, and we're running EWO uh, type jobs over there on the defensive side. So as the offender, you're gonna work your way over here. Here's your ICS panel. So it's your intercom system. We're gonna talk in the jet. You have your two radios that we use for UHF and VHF. You also have a third one for a lot of our SATCOM. You also have our ability to hear the uh, emitter tones and threat tones here, but we also break it out when we're talking with the tankers, and we also have the uh, capability for uh, HF as well for those longer durations over the uh, ocean type flying. But you have your selector knob. You will select the correct one. Make sure you have your wafer set correctly. Otherwise you may be talking on a frequency you don't want to. And if you look down here real quick, there's these two little uh, pedals, if you will. And the way to remember is right is always in, left is out. So if you just push in the right one, you're talking in the jet. This one's gonna go to whatever your wafer is set to. So we usually say left is out of the jet. Easiest way to remember it. Sometimes we have pilots fly back here uh, we got to remind them sometimes so they don't speak on the wrong radio. Uh, all right, and so then we go to the SMS panel or our stores management. This is how, as the OSO, you're interfacing in with your launchers, your weapon bay doors. This is where you're going to select. So you have part and full, like I talked about on the external, and then your open and close functions there when you're opening and uh, closing your doors. You also have your rotator right here. So you select the bay, either the forward, intermediate, or aft. You can select individual stations. So I wanna rotate the forward to station three. I select the launcher rotation and I'll rotate that uh, station down. Also a good quick way to see some faults that are there. You might break out that it says uh, nuclear uh, there, uh, unlock and then conventional arm safe. This is a holdover. This is the way we break it out is the smart weapons. So those JDAMs, we're gonna, and for the rotary launchers, we're gonna utilize uh, our unlock 
button there for the rotary launchers. And then for any of our uh, like dumb bombs and also for the, uh, the 28 carries and the 10 carries, we're gonna utilize the arm switch there. Transitioning out off of there, we have these keyboards in the back. The pods don't have these. It operates us a quicker way to punch in whether we're doing coordinate updates or sending messages over link. So we also have the link capable jet here for link 16. And then you'll see that the MFDs with the new IBS uh, upgrade that we have because of the different sustainment blocks that the B1 has gone through. This has kind of brought us into that next level uh, of lethality with being able to communicate front and back. We were able to see a lot of stuff duplicated on these color displays and we're able to communicate and they're able to see what we're doing. We're able to see what they're doing. It makes us better as a crew. As the O, I have two different displays. They also have an RDU here. So this is what I was talking about for our, our radar display. This will come with a uh, map, whether it be sweeping, and then it would be go ahead and go ahead and like mapping and painting those different uh, targets or just weather. We can use it for the weather as well and also for aircraft. So we'd be able to utilize our radar uh, and be able to go ahead and take those in targets, uh, targetable cords. Down here is our radar panel. With our radar panel, you'll see that I could take a, uh, it's called a high res map. That's going to go to that smaller uh, map that I was talking about. I'll kind of paint it as a uh, north up picture and I'll break out the roads or other radar significant things that we're looking at. And I could actually then use that for uh, an ability to look at what we're trying to actually strike and break it out. You have different modes. So you have map mode here. You have rendezvous. You have weather. So these ones, a lot of times, we'll use those for painting out the weather and avoiding those weather as necessary. And then uh, we come down here. We could also change the tilt of it. We can move the antenna uh, forward, left, and right. Go ahead and optimize our look angles. We also have the capability with the radar to track movers as well. And that's what this is, the GMTI. Uh, grand mover track indicator. We could go ahead and target movers with our radar as well. Obviously we prefer the pod for the fidelity that that offers us. We come up to the top. Uh, we'll start with here. So here you have your HSI. This is only on the uh, offensive side. It's going to help us with a lot of uh, tack ins when the pilot spin in the tack in up front. We can get distances there for us for the tankers. Uh, we are usually the one leading a lot of the rejoin when it comes to air refueling because the tanker will try to pick them up about 60-ish miles away. This kind of gives us that heads up of how far they actually are away. It'll help us in uh, getting us in a better position to uh, do the rejoin there. Then we come over here. You'll have your uh, attitude indicator. So that's a pretty standard there. Obviously, it's not uh, where it should be for us being on level ground, but when that's turned on, it'll show us our attitude there. And then here's our FPI or flight parameter indicator. Breaking it down, uh, our altitude, uh, speed, we could swap between true and calibrated. And then also when we're spinning in our altimeter settings. Back here, this is where we'll go ahead and put in all of our uh, mission data. So we'll go ahead and load cards into this. That's how we pull up uh, the waypoints that we're planning on flying to when we build those out in mission planning. We'll load it up here. That's a lot of the ground ops setup is uh, in the back station here. We're trying to get a lot of the things loaded into the system so we can go out and employ as necessary. Here's all our, our caution lights. You'll see when you get up to the front that the pilots have a lot more, but a lot of the stuff that we care about, which is a lot of the stores, or when it comes to, uh, this is the abandoned aircraft one. If that one goes off, that pretty much means that the pilots have left the plane and uh, you should be leaving very soon too. <laughs> Uh, up here is our light controls. So we have a spot and a floodlight. Right here, you're gonna see we have the spot is this one and then this is your flood. We can operate and because we don't operate with uh, NVGs at night, if we wanted to, we could turn that on and light up our station to give us better fidelity on reading our products and things like that. But we have the ability to use those here and then other light indicators as well, uh, just for our other additional lighting that we have on the side here. Then we get into our nav and uh, aux panel. So what this does, these are our WIU power. This is how we're going to communicate to those smart weapons. So down in the bays, since we didn't have a launcher, couldn't show you those 
uh, umbilical cords, if you want to call them that, but they're 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 the way that the weapon communicates with the jet. So it's a cannon plug that would plug into the actual uh, weapon down there. We power these ones on. They're for each of the bays, and then we're able to communicate. And when we change delay settings, uh, any of the impact angles, all that kind of stuff, and we want to pass that data to the weapon, that's how we're going to do it. So we have to make sure that's powered on. These are how we're turning on the actual computers now. We talk about the processors. So how we're actually turning on the avionics flight software, and then also the IBS will be turned on by that as well. We power on our radar here. And then these are uh, the power for our INSs, which is our inertial navigation system. So we have uh, both GPS, we're getting those feeds in into that, but part of it as well is we have the navigational system, we have a redundant system between the two, where if one is operating better than the other, we can select which one we want manually to make sure that we're optimizing our position because when it comes to putting bombs on targets, you wanna be as accurate as you can be. So part of the job of the OSO is maintaining that system through taking updates with our radar. So I will look at a fix, is what we call it. Uh, it's picking whatever that object is that's on the ground. We'll know what that exact point is. I'll go ahead and select that. That'll give me the opportunity to see how far off our system is. And I'll know if I have to rein it back in or if we're actually getting good GPS feed, it's automatically taking those updates. So even in a GPS out world, the B1 is still lethal because we're back here and we're maintaining the system and making sure we're still getting the good updates that we need. That is actually how we then go down to this panel, which is your bomb nav panel. And this has a mixture of both of that. So this is gonna be your missile and bomb. You have automatic and manual. So when we go automatic, we're then handing over the consent to the jet. So if I were to flip the unlock switch up and then I would go auto on my missile. That would be then when we're flowing through our launch acceptability uh, region, which is our LAR, the weapon would then come off the jet. It looks ahead and it sees what time that's going to be so it knows which weapon would be the next weapon, the weapon type we're looking for. And that's also plays into partially what, you know, with the B1, the, the FIGMS, which is the uh, fuel CG management system, that is moving fuel around to optimize our CG. To, it'll look ahead and see when weapons are coming off the jet. When you're releasing a bunch of 2,000 pound bombs, that's a lot of weight that's gonna be moving very quickly. This allows us to uh, work in a way that makes us more lethal for the sake that this system is gonna do it manually, for, uh, automatically for us. Then you have bomb. This is, again, talking, when we're talking to our dumb, uh, dumb bombs, uh, that's when you would go auto on that. Then you also see launch and releases there as well. So you could, in manual, uh, select a button and release a weapon on your own manually. Uh, not recommended. It's better to mission plan it out, and then uh, everything is, is easy enough for the computer to take that control there for you. And then you're just telling it when you want it to be able to release. Here's where we take our nav updates. So when I was talking about reining in the system, you have altitude updates. Uh, where you could uh, calibrate for with using the radar. So the radar offers us a lot of uh, ways to update our position error, but it doesn't give us a good Z axis. This helps us with that, with the vertical error there. And then you have your uh, radar button here. That's how we'll also utilize uh, for taking those position updates and or radar targeting. Then you come down to steering. So we could off, uh, we can command uh, fly to to whatever steer point we're trying to go to and this allows us to go ahead and uh, maneuver the jet if it's in a flight director is enabled and we could fly it towards our next waypoint by uh, selecting which one we want then as we look kind of more towards the uh, center console here kind of in between both stations this is how we connect uh, a lot of our beyond the line of sight equipment here for our displays and then this one right here is our recorder. So that's your data recorder right there. We'll enable these so we can get that recording of both audio and uh, video. And then our targeting pod, how we'll power it on from inside. And then also uh, how we turn on our laser there. This screen right here is another uh, MFD, but this one is our SITS, which is our central integrated test system. That is so, that when the uh, jet is running through all of its systems before, like I said with EMUX, 
If it flags something, we'll actually see a display pop up over here so we can monitor the systems. Uh, it's not perfect. What it's gonna do is it's gonna give us extra SA on what's going on. Sometimes we have to like then take that next step and do a little bit more troubleshooting to see, well, is this actually being flagged or was it a momentary thing? And uh, that's part of our job here in the aft station to relay that information to the uh, front station and give them better essay on what's going on. It has both uh, near English and raw data. Near English is a little bit more for uh, guys like me who wanted to just say, is it open or closed on this valve? The other ones show you the voltages on a lot of stuff to kind of break it down that way. But it'll pump out uh, codes and malfunctions there for us to then go ahead and troubleshoot. The uh, maintainers utilize this a lot for their data capture and they can speak a lot to it. Uh, that kind of helps them troubleshoot this jet for us and uh, get us back in the air. You know, they're the ones doing all the hard work when it comes to that. Right here, this is another tray. So this is where we'll dock a uh, laptop. The laptop is actually how we function in with our pod. So the pod will not be displayed on any of these screens. We actually have another laptop that would bring it to the jet and we could pull up a, uh, a program to go ahead and utilize for the pod. So we're gonna utilize that here. So you can see when we're out operating, you're gonna have a lot of different screens you're working with. And then within here, you're gonna be able to operate and uh, check out what's going on on the pod there. It also has another ability for us to pull up another moving map just for extra nav aid uh, purposes to make sure we're double checking where we are. That feed also goes up to the front station and I know they'll probably walk you through on that, but that is also gonna send a feed up to the front and they could see what we're doing on the pod as well. With this is our tow decoy system right here. So this is starting to play into where the DSO lives. This is how they're going to power on the system and uh, select the systems that they need to release those decoys and get them uh, working, as we like to say, out and barking. Here is your HF controls. So we'll spin in our frequencies for that. And obviously we could take control both in the front and the aft, but we'll control it there. And then this is going to go again to that sits control. Uh, maintenance is the one that's going to utilize this panel more than anybody else. We just usually leave it in normal because that's what we're going to utilize for. Right next to that is your environmental panel right there. So you see it says cold and hot. Depending on the jet you get, that knob may or may not work to the way that you think it will, but you can manipulate it a little bit auto is usually the way to go, but if you're finding that the jet is one of those really cold jets, maybe go full hot, turn it to manual, and try to warm your uh, toes up. Otherwise, your toes are gonna feel like they're gonna fall off. Uh, radiation filter, we do not utilize anymore because we are also not doing the nuclear mission. Uh, they also have the same light control panels right next to that one, as you can see. And then just above it, as on both sides here, here's another one of our vents uh, that we have back here for us. So on the DSO side, they don't have an HSI like we do on the offensive side. They have just the attitude indicator and the uh, FPI. And then they also have their own caution panels over there as well. For the DSO, we have three MFD screens that oper operates for them to have a, an ability to pull up a lot of the uh, threats that they need to see. So what that's gonna give them is more real estate, if you will, to be able to diagnose what the jet is seeing and then plan out what we're gonna have to do to maneuver the jet and or how we're going to survive the threat. Over here, you see is the RFS uh, ECM. So this is our countermeasure panel. This holds over a lot of stuff from older blocks. We have a lot of stuff now with IBS that you can do a lot of displays, uh, like I said, on the color displays that you can interface with. But this still gives you a lot of opportunities on uh, utilizing the defensive system and how you want to change depending on the threat that you're looking at. The big thing here is here's our EXCM. So when we talk about chaff and flare, outside the jet, you couldn't really see it because it's located on the top, but pretty much right above us and a little bit further aft is where the cavities sit. And we have eight cavities where we can put in chaff and flare, but that's how we're gonna select those programs and which ones we wanna release. They have another keyboard, obviously. And then all the way off there to the left, you'll see their power panel. That power panel for them is how they're gonna power on the, uh, the DAS. So they have selections over there and powering on our transmitters, how we're gonna arm the XCM. And also they have a flare jettison switch over there as well. Um, but that's how they're gonna turn on 
all the different things that involved in the defensive suite, including the TWIFT system, which is located in the back. A tail warning uh, function there. That one will automatically release chaffer flare depending on uh, what it's determining when that there's a missile inbound. Again, we prefer to leave it to us to make the ma manual depiction on that because we don't want to just trust an automated system when it could have some uh, errors in it. It's better for us to release the EXCM as planned, but that's for the tail warning function only. All the way to your left there though, they have the same uh, ICS panel as you can see there for their comms. And then they have the same, uh, as we call it, the potato, that cursor controller handle right there with all the different oper uh, operability that they have in there to go ahead and control their displays. They can also control the pod. So you can control the pod from any station. The radar is only controlled by the OSO. They have the same controls for their ejection mode knobs over there as well. The one panel that they have different, as you see, it's labeled as the EMUX panel. That's a way for us to kind of clear some errors that are going on the system. There's a latch reset in there. So because of the redundant system, sometimes that's all it is, is kind of resetting the system. They let it kind of rethink itself through and catch some of those errors to see if there are any er erroneous and kind of clearing of those. Other than that, it's going to be the same thing behind you there, their day-night indicator. There's their circuit breaker panels there. You'll see they have, a, uh, again, we have so many circuit breaker panels. These are the more the essential ones we have, and then we'll have more in the uh, cab behind us. As you come back forward, you can look here towards the center. So this is where, this, we, this is the actual like instructor panel uh, for the iWizzo. We used to have a jump seat that would sit here. Because we used to, when initially the B1, you could fly six individuals where you'd have a jump seat for an instructor here and a jump seat that would be up front in between the two crews. We no longer do that. Uh, but that was where a seat sat, so he had a way to con connect in uh, and be able to hear everything the same way we had the same controls you could uh, break down on each station. So when you come up into the jet, you have the hatch that's located right here. That will actually fold down so we could operate. Right now we have a grate in here that kind of allows us to move free, uh, freely without the hatch being down. But this is our ladder uh, control here. So right now it's uh, unlocked and down towards the gravity extend. We could gravity extend it where the ladder will fall down and then we could also uh, bring up the ladder through electronical controls right here. The big thing with this is if those fail, we'll go ahead and we have to actually use a hand crank to bring up the ladder or lower it. That is not preferred. That is a very bad workout. All right, and just another part of our pre-flight when we're in the back here of the cab. This is where a lot of your LRUs, uh, which are line replaceable units, they're literally boxes that maintenance will put in and then re-plug in. So you'll see so many different wires, so many different cabling going around and also plenty of circuit breakers. We have more circuit breakers back here, and you can see how there's so many different redundancies and systems we got running in, so it gets very challenging sometimes to diagnose what's going on. But during our pre-flight, we'll kind of walk back here, make sure that the right circuit breakers are all pushed in and there's nothing that's been, uh, uh, that's, that's popped, that shouldn't be, and isn't collared. But then the only other things I really want to show you back here is we have a little door here. This is how we'll do our data recording. We'll go ahead and uh, put those devices into there. That again will capture a lot of our screen data that we have there. And then just another backup to a lot of our comms and visual displays. Uh, we'll put another recording device into here as well. But that pretty much sums up what's going on back here. Uh, the only other things I could show you real quick. Yeah, watch your head. It's very crammed in space. Uh, down here, we back up, uh, look at the backup oxygen. You can see where it's sitting right there, about, looks like 1800. Uh, we could get a readout here, so we'll look at that during a pre-flight. And then we'll also go ahead and set uh, the fuel weights and everything there for the CG balances for that FIGM system that I was explaining earlier. Uh, but we'll set it in a primary and a secondary box. Also over here is the uh, emergency seal release. So sometimes when that hatch seals, the rubber seal that goes around will actually stay inflated. This is just a quick way to release it. And then uh, when you pull that tab, this snap down, uh, snap back up. So kind of watch your fingers on that. 
And with that, that sums up the aft station, and uh, I hope you like the walk around. Hi, I'm Captain Cameron Sorrels, call sign Burnout, and I'm a pilot on the B1B Lancer. So, what you're looking at here is going to be the front station of the B1. Uh, you have the left seat and the right seat. One thing slightly unique about the B1 is that both of these seats are more or less interchangeable. So typically in most aircraft you'd see the younger guy in the right seat, the more senior guy here in the left seat. But in the, the B1 that's not the case, you can flip flop, it doesn't really matter if it's the younger guy sitting here, the older guy sitting there. Uh, it's interchangeable and um, those kind of normal roles don't really apply in this plane. So big picture, the cockpit is laid out in a uh, very uh, kind of friendly way so a lot of the stuff you need is within arm's reach and organized pretty well so uh, for normal kind of pre-flight walking you around my typical flow is from left to right and then uh, we'll hit the overhead panel as well so starting here on the left hand side if you will on this far back side are the uh, gonna be your NVGs you have a brightness knob and then a power knob for it as well Moving up here, just one uh, panel, you have your heading selector switch. So there's a GSS and an INS. So basically that's going to uh, determine what shows your digital heading on both of the MFDs up here. Moving over to the right one, it's ADC selector, that's air data computer. So there's two air data computers on this side. The left seat will stay in number one, the right seat will stay in at number two, and you'll compare um, different parameters like airspeed, altitude, uh, things like that. FDC is going to be your flight director computer, so it's going to give you good data on um, basically what your flight director is providing you, so when to turn left, when to turn right, and things like that. Your VSI, not really used anymore, that was the uh, vertical scale indicator. And then moving over one more to the right here is your ADC high and low test, so basically we use this for certain ground uh, ops and certain tests of systems. When you flip it to the high, it's going to input high parameters or high numbers into parameters like AOA, airspeed, altitude, things like that. And when you push it to the low, it's going to input low parameters into your AOA, airspeed, and altitude. Moving forward one more. This is going to be uh, pretty much your communication panel. This is how you control volume and what uh, radio you want to talk on. So. We'll go top to bottom here, left to right. ICS, if you push it up or down, pulling it um, up is how you can hear it. Pushing it down is gonna mute that for you. And then your volume control works just like any other knob for volume, clockwise and counterclockwise. Moving over is UHF-1 and UHF-2. So same thing, pulling it up and down uh, to hear and to listen. HF, so there's an HF, the uh, control panels on that right side and one in the aft station as well. Here's going to be TFR tanker. What you hear on this is going to be um, different beeps whenever you're doing terrain following. So if you're a little bit high, you'll get a certain beep. And if you're a little low, you'll get a certain beep. And then hopefully hear a or feel a corresponding correction in the jet. And then tanker is what allows you to hear and talk on the boom interphone. So once the boom actually connects to the plane, you're able to talk back and forth with that boom operator. Otherwise, you're going to have to do it on a normal radio. Over here is your TACAN, just like any other plane, you can hear the Morse code of the TACAN. And here is the ILS and terminal threat tones. So the ILS will give you um, the normal Morse code for the identifier, and the terminal threat will give you uh, certain tones based off of different things. The IFF is just going to be your normal uh, identification of friend or foe. Again, just more uh, tones, if it's a good, good reply or a bad reply. Your emitter, same thing. There's different uh, radars that can look at you on the ground, so you're gonna get different tones from that. And then this one here, unlabeled, is COM3. That's typically gonna be used for some more of your beyond line of sight or Link 16, things like that. Here is uh, how you select hot mic, normal, or call. Hot mic is your pretty typical, you don't have to push anything, you're always uh, talking. Normal is what we fly in most of the time. And then call, when you flip it there, it's gonna go back if you don't hold it but that's gonna amplify and make your voice louder than all the other crew members. This wafer here is how you determine which one you wanna talk on. So for example, if I wanna talk on COM3, I'll select that, and then I can use my push to talk to transmit on that. This is the master volume knob, so this controls all of them, how loud you hear, and how quiet you uh, may wanna hear. Seat adjustment up here, your typical up, down, and then forward and aft. Your ejection mode knob, 
uh, if it's in the manual position, you're the only one that has control over your seat. So if you want to uh, eject out of the aircraft, you will have to pull your own handles. In the auto, that's gonna be anyone in the aircraft can eject you regardless of your pins or your uh, seat armed or safe. Moving up here to the flight control panel, this is your standby pitch trim. So um, obviously not the normal path we use because it's not super uh, friendly. But if you need to trim nose up or trim nose down, that's gonna be how you do that with the standby path. And then this one is normal yaw. So not a uh, turbo prop, it's just got four engines. So yaw is not something you typically have to use. You don't really have to step on any rudder or anything like that. So this is only used um, if you're seeing uh, potentially uncoordinated uh, parameters whenever you are flying straight and level. Cursor controller here, it's gonna control um, everything on this right MFD. So kind of explain this right MFD real quick. This is gonna be all of our tactical data. So anything for weapons, employments, uh, defensive execution, things like that. We're able to put a bunch of different uh, screens and a bunch of different data up here. And the way we control that screen is either with these bezel buttons or much more user friendly with this cursor controller here. Moving forward one more, uh, you'll see we go to the thr throttle quadrant here. So I'll lift them up just a second so you can see we have this alter throttle here. So in the event that we have a primary throttle failure, we're still able to use these um, switches right here that correspond with each one, two, three, and four engine. And it's pretty intuitive. If you decrease, you're gonna lower the power, lower the speed. If you increase, you're gonna increase power and thus increase your speed. So hopefully uh, on a normal day, everything is working normal. And this is what you're gonna use to control. So. Uh, we have four throttles, one for each engine, and they are all independent. You can move them one at a time or all together. The detents here, so you're going to have idle at that backstop. There's a first detent for mill power, which is already pretty loud, and then you can bring them right over that hump. That's going to be min A, B. So you're going to have a couple confirmers that will let you know that the afterburner has lit. So one is going to be pushing it up over that detent. That's the first thing you're going to hear. And the second, you'll look here and you'll see four lights that go green and you'll want to see this total fuel, sorry, you want to see the fuel flow indicator for each engine going up into that 20,000 mark. And then you'll also see here for the fuel flow total, that number will increase drastically from mill to afterburner power. So for a normal takeoff, uh, what you want to do is get on the runway, make sure you're lined up on center line, step on the brakes, go to mill, and we want to see all these uh, instruments go up to the correct parameters for mill power. Once you see them stabilized there, you're going to go into min AB. You want to check that you get four good lights and four good swings, and then check that fuel flow total, make sure everything uh, is lighting appropriately, and then you push it up into max power let those brakes release. Uh, for most of our takeoffs, we're rotating anywhere around 150 to 160 knots, depending on gross weight. And we'll typically, once we hit that rotate speed, pull back to eight degrees nose high and accelerate to 350 knots. 350 knots, pull it out of afterburner, put it into mill power, and by that time you'll lower the nose to about four degrees, hold 360 knots on the climb out until you get to your altitude. And then from there, we're typically cruising at about 0.72 Mach. So moving forward, uh, the next thing that you can notice here is the wing sweep lever. So uh, the last active plane currently in the inventory that does have a sweep, uh, sweeping wing. So we can go anywhere from 15, which is far forward, which is the uh, current configuration that it's in, all the way aft to 67 and a half wing. And this functions pretty much as another flight control. The faster we go, the further back we're gonna wanna sweep, and the slower we go, the more forward we're gonna wanna sleep, sweep. Um, big picture for 15 and 20, you're looking at uh, takeoff and landing. We're wanting to get uh, really as slow as we can, but still keep as much lift as we can. And then 25 wing is gonna be for most of your cruising. And then 45, 55, and 67 and a half are gonna be for tactical employment. Uh, moving forward one more is gonna be your hatch jettison handle. So if you wanna look up here real quick, if you were to pull that, this hatch right here would jettison and uh, in the event of an ejection, um, pulling the handles or pulling this hatch us and this entire hatch here is gonna come out and you're gonna end up going up on the ejection. Moving forward one more. So we'll come up here. This is our normal um, 
pressure altitude setting. So uh, typically above 18,000, you would uh, put 2992. So that's how you set it. And then coming back uh, for takeoff or landing, you just spin that dial and it will set uh, whatever altimeter setting you're looking for. Here, this is how we use um, kind of our mock airspeed altitude or radar altimeter bug. So uh, just like in most planes, they, they basically tell you to keep your um, bugs in front of you. So the same thing, mock, whenever you're taking off, typically set that to 0.72 to give you an indication um, that you're approaching your in route airspeed. Airspeed for uh, takeoff, we'll set it as rotate for the pilot flying and the pilot not flying will set it to either rotate or your decision speed. So uh, if the decision speed is less than your rotate, you'll typically hear the pilot not flying saying committed. And then a few knots later, you'll hear the pilot flying saying rotate. Altitude again, so setting it on takeoff for your final level of altitude or intermediate uh, altitude, whatever you have. And then on the descent, using that down to make sure you don't miss altitudes that air traffic control is giving you for the descent. Radar altimeter, depending on what approach or landing we're going to fly or um, uh, if we need it for anything else, we'll set it for 200 feet for an ILS usually and then for a visual pattern, typically setting that for about 500 just to give you some sort of situational awareness on how close you are to the ground and where you are. The way you increase or decrease any of these is going to be with your set knob right here. So increase, decrease, and then it will uh, maintain there. Right below that is a radar altimeter test button. So if you push that and you have the radar altimeter on, it'll run you through a quick test and you're looking to check out um, that the numbers that you wanna see on the screen are what you're getting. Your heading knob, so again, if uh, air traffic control is telling you turn right heading 180, this will be the first thing you go to, spin that into 180, and it gives you some situational awareness on how much uh, longer you have to turn and when you should uh, begin that rollout to shack the heading. Of course, is uh, the same thing how it works in most airplanes. So if you're wanting to dial in the ILS course, you can spin this in to get the frequency and you'll get your uh, normal uh, course deviation and help you intercept that course. Down here, station power. So it's gonna make sure all this stuff is powered on and help it uh, or give it the power that it needs to get to these screens. Flight director. So this is going to be um, basically your guidance or what's, what source you want to use your flight director to help guide you. So for TACAN, again, if I want to fly a TACAN course of 130, I will put this to TACAN, dial 130 into the course, and then I'll get that flight director telling me uh, if I need to turn left or turn right to maintain that 130. So we'll go around the horn uh, with it. So. CNMS, we have a way to do navigation up here in the front with our communication navigation management system. And we can input flight plans into that and basically get um, guidance for that. Not typically used, we uh, usually, for our en route stuff, we're gonna use the nav, which is how we're gonna manage most of our flight plans. ILS back course, so at some airports, they don't have um, an ILS for both runways. So you're gonna wanna use the back course for uh, a particular runway if they need you to. The ALA, one really cool feature about the B1 is you can use the uh, radar to basically pick a spot on the ground and then the aft station they can put in a uh, descent profile that you want, elevation that you uh, that the ground was measured at and everything like that and you can essentially fly a precision approach down to uh, the point on the ground that the radar has. TACAN, uh, like we said, functions normally if you dial in a TACAN frequency you can spin that course in and it will give you direction there. There is no VOR uh, receiver on this aircraft. ILS, again, is going to work like a normal uh, aircraft. You'll spin in the frequency and it'll give you flight director guidance left or right to help you maintain that. And then with the glide slope, it'll give you an up and down guidance as well. So super handy in this plane when you're flying down final. Uh, speeds around 160, 170. If you're flying a no flap, it's gonna be uh, in excess of 200 knots down final. So having a flight director give you um, guidance as to climbing, diving, and uh, turning left to right to maintain that course uh, really takes a lot of, uh, really frees up a lot of brain bites for the pilots to fly a better approach. Going here to tanker rendezvous. So what the this mode was meant to be is the whizzes in the back would lock up a tanker uh, with the radar and you'll get flight director guidance uh, basically uh, 
for a crash course into where that tanker is. We don't really use it a whole lot because if you can imagine like a football, when you uh, throw a football to someone, you wanna lead their turn or you wanna lead where they're running to. So same thing with this, this is just gonna give you guidance to where they currently are. So in, uh, in that pure pursuit, if you will, you're gonna end up really far behind the tanker, which isn't what you want, because then all you have to do, uh, all you can use is speed, which is gonna take you a long time to catch up. So what we like to do is lead that tanker. So we're hopefully in a good spot right behind them, about a thousand feet below and ready to AR quickly and make the rejoins a little bit more expedited. So here in this nav mode, this is what we uh, fly in for all of our tactical employments uh, and really all of our en route stuff. So the Wizzos in the back will load the flight plan into the jet and they'll be able to manage and manipulate different waypoints and um, things like that. So we keep it in there and it gives us flight director guidance for all the stuff that uh, they are managing in the back. Manual heading. This is basically going to give you steering guidance towards uh, whatever heading you have selected with this. So on our previous example, if uh, air traffic control said to turn right to 180, I could flip it to manual heading and then spin in 180 and the jet would do roughly a 30 degree bank turn uh, on its own to intercept that 180 heading. And then the off button, which is where it typically is. To the right one, here's the uh, pitch, steer, uh, pitch steering switch. It's got three options, present altitude, off, and turf flu. Present altitude isn't used, um, and since we don't do turf flu, correction, since we don't do train following anymore. So kind of in conjunction with all of this is going to be uh, what most people would know as our autopilot. And the B1, it's called AFCS, Automatic Flight Control System. So you have a couple different modes here. This first one is gonna be a take command. So if the left seat wants to take command, they'll press that uh, and you'll see the green light saying take command. And that means you can press any of these buttons and activate the buttons. However, if the right seat uh, has a take command and you do not um, have that light illuminated, you cannot manipulate any of these uh, switches. So take commands that first one engage is the second one here and that's the basic modes the engage will hold whatever pitch and whatever bank you're currently at it will not hold a current altitude so if i'm one degree nose high it will just maintain one degree nose high and i will continue to climb the couple other ones down here are going to be your altitude so if i hook up engage and altitude it's going to maintain whatever altitude i had it hooked up at and then the next one is going to be flight director which is going to reference what i have this selected to so if I have this selected to TACAN and I have the course dialed in here and I hook up flight director, this switch is gonna reference what this is selected to and it will go fly uh, what we have it programmed to fly to. And again, typically how that's utilized though is gonna be in that navigation portion to uh, basically relieve a lot of the workload for the pilots so they can focus on other things. Even in a tactical employment, hooking up the flight director and altitude hold um, really allows you to focus on other things that give you some big picture essay. Two other modes that we have are gonna be airspeed and mock hold. So on a climb out, if you wanna maintain uh, an airspeed, like we said, we typically climb out at 360 knots. So what I can do is I can hand fly the jet to 360 knots, press the engage and press the airspeed hold and the plane will modulate its pitch given whatever power setting uh, I have set to maintain 360 knots and that mock hold works, works the exact same. So in route, uh, typically wanna climb out, or correction, typically wanna stay at 0.72 mock. So if I do mock hold at 0.72, um, I can play around with these throttles and basically change the pitch. So um, obviously the higher power setting you have with that, the more nose high the jet's gonna have to be to maintain that uh, airspeed or that mock and the lower power setting you have, it's gonna have to go nose low to maintain that airspeed and mock. The other two buttons on here are gonna be the auto throttle and the terrain following button. So auto throttle uh, is gonna be basically your airspeed or your mock hold, but it's not going to maintain, or it's not going to vary your pitch to maintain that. It's just going to vary the throttle uh, positioning to maintain the airspeed that you have. And then the terrain following one is gonna be how we hook up the terrain following, which we'll get to that panel here shortly. So moving on, you have your typical uh, spin dial clock here that we use, the radio call for the tail, and these two lights here are going to be your 
terminal on the top and approach on the bottom. Not really used, but you can put a final approach fix in the CNMS, and these two uh, lights will give you situational awareness on uh, really how far you are from that final approach fix. Okay. So these two buttons are correction two lights. You have the uh, terminal and the approach. So you can put a final approach fix in the CNMS uh, and it gives you kind of situational awareness, but not really used again. Most of our flight plan uh, management is done in the aft station. And these two screens really give you a lot more essay than these two lights do. So this left screen, it's the same for both sides. Left screen is a left screen, right screen is the right screen. The left screen is going to have uh, what most people think of when they think of uh, pilot data. So in your Cessna 172, think the six pack, that's all going to be on this screen here. So it's cut in half about right there on the screen. The top half is going to be your attitude. It's going to have your pitch dive and your uh, roll as well. And then you're going to have your altitude, airspeed and mock uh, bars on the outsides. Top left, you're going to have your AOA as well and on the bottom you're going to have uh, bottom left down here in this corner you're going to have how many g's you're pulling on the bottom half is going to be your cdi uh, and your uh, rotating compass so whenever you're flying down an ils this is or uh, intercepting attack and course this is where you would see your course deflection and making sure that you have that centered up and then on the kind of top left here for that half, it's showing you what waypoint you're flying to, how much time you have to get to that waypoint, and um, how far in mileage that is. Moving on to the right hand side is going to be all the tactical data again. So that's going to be uh, all the stuff relating to weapons employment, defensive, execution, and then uh, you can uh, manage some of the different systems from here. So inputting your squawk, depending on uh, what upgrade version of the jet you're on, you can input the squawk uh, on this screen. So going up top here, we have the master audio cutout button. So uh, just like in most airplanes in the B1, you get a gear horn, you get an overspeed horn, um, and different tones and things like that. So if you want to silence the tone because they get really loud, you just push that and it will cut that tone out until you re-trigger the incident that caused that tone to go off in the first place. Prep to eject. So if you flip this up, there's a uh, bell, just kind of like you had in your old high school, uh, metal bell that will sound in here. And the whizzes in the back will get a uh, message or a light that illuminates that says prep to eject. So in the event that you're not able to talk to them in the back, not able to have any communications whatsoever, you can flip that switch and let them know, hey, uh, things aren't going so hot. We're gonna have to get out of this aircraft pretty quick. Up here is just uh, some more caution lights. This is gonna be your master caution. So anytime something illuminates down here or something illuminates here, you're gonna get a light that flashes up here, drawing your attention to um, the fact that something is not uh, as it should be. Down here in between my legs, we have a flight connect, or sorry, a flight disconnect stick. So what you do for this one is you would pull that uh, handle in here and pull it up and that's going to disconnect this stick from that stick. Uh, there's certain malfunctions where that needs to be pulled, where these sticks can lock up or something like that. So just want to go ahead and pull that. It will separate the two sticks and they will fly independently of each other. Rudder adjustment here. So I will pull these back. So as you can see, there's the rudder pedals there. Work just like a normal plane, push on it to uh, make the rudder left, right, and then the top is still going to be your brakes um, and how you would stop. This plane does have nose wheel steering, so we don't have to use differential braking. And to engage the nose wheel steering, you can see right there, nose wheel steering disengage. So you push up on that and that would engage the nose wheel steering. And so from there, I can just uh, more or less drive it like a car, except for you're using your rudder pedals. But that nose wheel steering is still going to uh, turn and not use differential braking. So moving up uh, along the cockpit again, you're looking at your standby um, attitude indicator, and it also has a standby altimeter. So just like every instrument rated plane, uh, you're gonna have that standby system there. Up top are all your fire warning uh, lights and extinguishing uh, agents. So for here, you have your left overwing, left APU, engine one, two, three, four, right APU, and right overwing fairing. So the overwing fairing, I'm sure is unfamiliar to a lot of people. That is the uh, part basically where the, uh, when the wings sweep that they're gonna kind of tuck into is gonna be that overwing fairing area. There's a lot of fuel 
a lot of hydraulic and a lot of oxygen going through that area. So if a fire were to happen in there, you would definitely want to have the ability to put that out. So the way that you would put out a fire for any of these, uh, you would first get the master caution and you would get a tone in your headset and you could look over here and one of these lights would be illuminated. So you would say we have a fire in engine one, you press engine one and go left agent discharge switch to main and that would be uh, getting you some fire suppression into that engine. If it doesn't go out, you can always use the reserve and then hopefully uh, after a main and a reserve, the fire is extinguished and you can go home. Going down one more is going to be a true airspeed and a ground speed indicator. Not uh, used a ton, but in flight it's always set to true airspeed just to give us some situational awareness on what our true airspeed is. So we'll go through here. Um, this is going to be all of your engine uh, indications essentially. So you can see each one of them has a one, two, three, four going across all of them. Power level is not really used, but it's on the scale of one to ten. And it's supposed to be kind of an indication of how much power uh, you have left or how much power the engines are putting out. Fan RPM, so think of this as the blades that you can actually see in the front of the engine that's telling you uh, what percentage they're spinning at of uh, what they're allowed to spin. Engine temperature, so um, this is just going to be your exhaust gas temperature, uh, letting you know how hot or how cold the engines are running. Really used a lot of times during engine start, so whenever you're starting the engines, you want to make sure that they're not getting uh, above specific temperatures, otherwise you're going to need to abort the start. Core RPM is going to be probably the uh, indicator we look at more often. So with four big engines like this, when you're taxiing around, you really want to be aware of what's behind you. So a general rule of thumb for us, whenever we're taxiing around, is don't push the throttles up to 80. Uh, more than 80%, which you think seems like quite a bit, but the uh, engines idle around that 65% mark. So you really don't want to push these engines up too much while you're on the ground, otherwise you risk uh, tipping some things over. Moving down is going to be the nozzle positioners. So the more you push up the throttles, the more the nozzles are going to close. So in idle, they're full open. In mill, they're full closed. And then going into afterburner, it kind of reverses. So min AB, they're going to open up a little bit. And then max AB, they're going to open up all the way. And that's just to help the airflow coming out of the back of the engine um, not exit too quickly or not exit too slowly and cause a compressor stall on the engine. Fuel flow indicator, uh, as you can see here, goes up from zero to 100,000 pounds. Uh, typically, in mill power settings or below, you're uh, probably going to be less than that 10,000 pound per engine, but then getting up to that AB, you're uh, easily going to get over 20,000 pounds uh, in each engine. So, on a takeoff, it's pretty common to see 200,000 plus pounds being burned by all four engines. Now, granted, we're not holding it for a super long period of time, but uh, 200,000 pounds per hour is nothing uncommon to see. Your normal oil pressure and oil quantity here, nothing too fancy, uh, just your normal gauge, 0, 20, 40, 60, and then your oil quantity is just a pure percentage uh, that's full of the engine. Moving over here to uh, some of the indications of where our flight controls are. So this is our stab. This is going to be neutral, and when you pull back on the stick, you're going to see this deflect, and when you push down on the stick, you're going to see that deflect as well, uh, basically showing you where it, the uh, stab is and how much travel you do or do not have left. Same thing for the spoiler, so going to the right, you're going to see the right side spoilers deflect. Going to the left, you're going to see the left side spoilers deflect as well. And then for your rudder, uh, deflecting it left or right, you're going to see that again. Speed brakes probably one of the more important things to check here. So whenever you're coming back into land, sometimes you have to use the speed brakes to slow down. Uh, and before landing, you want to make sure that they are in. So good one to check right there, making sure that that reads zero. Slat and flap indicator here. So the only thing we have for the slaps is uh, when the jet turns on, we have power. You'll see extended or retracted. And then when it's got these barber poles like this, it's either not working or it's in transit. So you would typically put the slats down and then go to half flaps, and then go to flaps full down. To the right one, we have our wing sweep indicator. So as you can see right now, this yellow is showing where it's commanded to. It's commanded to 15, and the uh, indicator there is showing that it's at 15. So whenever we move our wing sweep lever here on the side, you'll see this yellow go down to say about 45, 
and then travel about one degree per second. So give it about 45, correction, give it about 30 seconds, and it'll be at that 45 degree mark. The other place to see this is a digital readout that I forgot to mention uh, here in this uh, rotating compass. There's actually a picture of a little top-down view of a B1, and it'll give you a little animation of where your wings are, and it'll tell you a specific uh, digital readout, which is super handy, because as you can see, this indication here uh, takes a little bit of um, looking at to figure out exactly what single digit number it's at, but on that uh, tactical display there, you can get a quick, easy readout of the number it's at. So what you're looking at here is going to be uh, the landing gear system. So whenever you want to push it down, you're going to push that um, knob forward and then pull down on the handle and that should get the gear coming down. Here's an indication for each forward, left, and right gear. And uh, so the way we want to confirm that the gear is down to this plane is you'll have uh, make the call out handle down, lights out in the handle, three green, and then the AOA indexers uh, on the top should be illuminated as well. This is the alter gear extend here. So if we get into a situation where we need to use the uh, emergency hydraulic accumulators, uh, you would basically flip the switch down and then go to the down position there and that would hopefully drop all three of the landing gears. However, it will leave the main gear doors open. With the normal uh, extension and retraction, the main gear doors will swing uh, as they were designed to. Going down one, we have the uh, door close switch here. So if we want to close the doors from the front station, just lift that guard up, push it in, and all three of the doors will close. And then we have our consent switch up here. So once we do, when we're in a tactical environment, um, part of our checks are to go release in the front, uh, enabling the aircraft to basically release weapons as it should. If we are safe up front and they are armed in the back, the jet will not release weapons. So we have to be released up front and they have to be uh, configured appropriately in the back. So one of the coolest panels, in my opinion, uh, on this plane is going to be this panel right here, the terrain following panel. So in a general uh, kind of overarching sense, what this plane was designed to do was to go uh, have a low altitude penetration into a contested environment. So the way the system works is it utilizes the radar in the front of the aircraft to basically scan ahead and then uh, send data to a computer and a computer will generate a terrain following profile based off of what altitude you have selected down here. Uh, so it can go pretty low uh, down to 200 feet uh, above the ground and you don't have to be able to see out front. You don't have to be able to uh, pull back or be able to fly. All you need to be able to do is trust the system and uh, set it up correctly. So the way this works is you're going to have the on-off switch, uh, pretty simple right here. And then each one of these A, B, C, D, all the way through Kilo, they correspond with a specific altitude above the ground. Right here is going to be a priority switch. So if you want to prioritize terrain following for that radar, or if you want to prioritize taking maps with the radar, you can uh, give that there. And it's going to change a couple kind of nuanced things uh, with how the radar prioritizes what it's doing. Here is the soft, medium, or hard ride. So as you can imagine, if you uh, have a larger hill or you have a mountain in front of you um, and the jet is making decisions on when to climb and when to descend for you, it's going to need um, some guidance on how many Gs you want it to pull up. So with the hard ride, it's going to wait a little bit later and pull up with a little bit more G-force. The medium is going to be kind of a sweet spot in between and the soft ride is going to be uh, very gentle and it's going to uh, be more of a gradual climb to get to that desired profile. Rain reject here. So this is just to help the radar um, uh, basically differentiate from what's rain and what's terrain uh, out there in front of it. Moving on down, you have your master caution panel. Uh, so you can see there is a slew of lights. Um, bunch of different systems on this aircraft. Uh, pretty much each thing that we go over has an associated uh, light that can illuminate and an associated checklist that's utilized to um, fix the issue. So kind of now moving down to this panel here, this is your um, ILS, so on off switch right there. And if you want to change the frequency uh, that you have, it's that top one for the uh, digits over there and then the right one for some of your decimal places. 
radar altimeter right here. So typically it's in the auto and you can see which channel it's using, if it's using channel one or channel two, you can see that in there. Uh, another cool thing with the terrain following is going to be this auto let down switch that you have here. So uh, what you can do is basically be cruising at say 20,000 feet and you can use this auto let down switch with the radar altimeter and the radar uh, and it will essentially point you pretty nose low and then level you off uh, in conjunction with this terrain following equipment at a uh, specified altitude, again, say a thousand feet above the ground. So in order to go from 20,000 feet to a thousand feet above the ground, uh, in theory, there's no pilot intervention required. You just need to make sure the system is set up correctly and the plane will nosedive and level off all on its own. Down here uh, is our IFF panel. So uh, what most people would know is their squawk. You can set your squawk code right here and the different modes that we have. Just your normal standby and normal settings. Some of the upgraded jets are going to have um, the ability to set the squawk with the uh, MFDs up front. Down here is your TACAN. So like I said, there's no VOR in this jet. It's just TACAN. That's how you change uh, your tens place there. And then changing your ones place right there. And then for the air to air mode, so if we're flying in formation, uh, you'll set up the uh, tack in and the Yankee mode. And that'll be able to get you uh, situational awareness on how far you are from the other person in your formation. That's for the normal ground transmit and receive. And that's for your air transmit and receive. And the other ones are just air to air receive and regular receive. Coming down here, so it's more stuff to do with uh, kind of your takeoff and landing. So the anti-skid um, switch just works uh, kind of like your normal car. We fly around, uh, taxi, takeoff, and land with it on, which prevents our uh, tires from skidding and potentially shredding. Parking brake is pretty uh, simple here. So what you do is put your feet up here on the brakes, push the toes down, and you would press and hold that. It would engage, and you would be able to feel uh, that it engage when you take your feet off the brake, the brakes will stay depressed and you'll get a nice light there letting you know. This is the emergency brake switch. So if you find yourself on a landing roll and you press on the brakes and nothing happens, you can move that switch to emergency and get some actuations out of the braking system and stop before the end of the runway. Data case light, just for the lights down there uh, when they used to keep maps up here. Nose wheel steering, so there's two modes for the nose wheel steering, takeoff and land in your taxi mode. Pretty self-explanatory there. The taxi is going to be for anything below 20 knots. You're going to get a lot more sensitivity, a lot more uh, ability to turn. Takeoff and land is going to be um, for your normal takeoff and landing. It's going to be a lot less sensitive and feel a little bit more uh, like a rudder in an actual plane. However, it's still the nose wheel steering moving. You're landing a taxi light right there. The landing lights uh, we're going to keep on for uh, obviously landing. Super bright really light up the runway from a good distance away and make night landing in the plane uh, much easier than it otherwise could be. And then taxi, when you're taxiing around, uh, same thing, just wanna have that in taxi. So moving up here, so you have um, basically two different ways to control the plane and it's typically going to be blended. So the right seat is going to be a mechanical path, which is not going to use um, some of these augmentation systems. And the left seat is going to have more of your augmentation there's going to be your electrical path utilizing some of these. So the way to think of this is this row is going to impact that row. So we have pitch, roll, and yaw augmentation, and then we have the pitch, roll, and yaw trim. So the way that you would normally do this is turn these all on, and that would go ahead and activate the electrical path for the flight controls, allowing um, you to get some more control out of the aircraft and then your normal pitch, roll, and yaw trims would also be engaged. So kind of explaining these, the uh, one cool feature about the B1 is it has a uh, system known as EMUX. So the best way to kind of describe it is as a uh, kind of supercomputer and robot. It tracks just about everything on this plane, the health of it, and is able to kind of power things on, power things off to keep the aircraft up and running. So with this normal, pitch trim and the normal, uh, whenever I make a command up here on the pitch trim, it's going to go through um, Emux, and Emux is gonna basically uh, approve that command and say, yep, 
the normal pitch trim path is working and Emux is working, so uh, I will let you pitch nose up or nose down. The uh, alter path here, so taking it from the normal to alter, it's gonna be that same path. We're just gonna go ahead and skip Emux. So if there's an Emux issue, I can still use the pitch trim on the control stick and get the pitch that I want. Standby is gonna be that same switch that we showed you over here by the throttles. Uh, not as user friendly, but still works. Roll trim, same thing, your normal and alter. And then um, yaw again. So the other two switches over here, it's gonna be your flap slat reset and then your uh, spoiler switch. So the only time we turn the spoilers off is whenever we're doing air, air refueling. So the spoilers can make the aircraft a little bit uh, sensitive. So in order to dampen some of those controls, we'll turn the spoilers off for refueling. Down here, this switch is going to be your alternate wing sweep. So in the event of a wing sweep malfunction, you're able to utilize this um, to hold the wings where they are. So if you uh, say you sweep the wings and you see a wing sweep issue on the master caution panel, you can quickly place the switch to hold that will freeze all uh, of the wing movement regardless of issues and then get in the checklist and diagnose from there. In order to go from this uh, hold position back to normal, you would just go to the reset and that would reset it back to the normal path. And then if the checklist directs, there's a lot of issues going on, you can hold it in forward and that will slowly sweep the wings back to forward, but it is spring loaded back to that hold position so you don't just inadvertently sweep the wings forward when you don't want to. And then off is just going to be purely uh, turning that wing sweep off. Here is gonna be our emergency speed brake um, retraction and the alter path for the speed brake. So in the event that the speed brakes are out and uh, you cannot get them in, you can go ahead and flip that switch back to emergency retract and it will retract the gears. As I'm sure you guys were pointed out on the walk around, the smucks, the veins on that front part, this is how you turn them off. Uh, we don't really use it anymore since we don't do the terrain following anymore. Moving down here, we'll move this. This is gonna be a backup control panel for your uh, communication. So in the event that our primary uh, way to control the communication fails, we can still use uh, the radio to talk on. This is going to be uh, your CNMS, your communication navigation management system. So this is gonna be how we change a lot of the radios. Uh, we will input the flight plan in here as well, just in case something happens at the back station where we still need to um, get to a waypoint and fly an appropriate course. Another thing this is really used for is on long duration flights. Um, we'll be able to use this and wind the flight plan and get really, really accurate timing uh, to a specific waypoint that may be three, four, five uh, points in the future. Other than that, yep, you got your normal bright uh, control knob there and then your keypad to input data in there. Moving down, one more is gonna be the good stuff. You have your uh, engine start switches here. So once you get to that point in the checklist, this is how you'll turn the engines on. So uh, you would do it, you would pull it up over into the run position, which is uh, vertical, and then push them up one more to get to the start. And that's gonna start getting that core rotation going. And then at a certain point, uh, inject the fuel and then light the spark. Speaking of spark, Move up here, this is gonna be your ignition switch. So it's off, auto, and continuous. Typically fly around with that in auto, just in case something happens. The uh, igniters can automatically kick on and keep your engine uh, spinning. Speed lockup, not really used anymore, but uh, what you would use that for again, low level, you would turn that to the auto position and that would keep your core RPM uh, at 90% or above to basically uh, reduce the potential of a compressor stall. Anti-ice switch up here in South Dakota used quite a bit. So you have off, auto, and manual. Uh, on the ground, you wanna keep that in manual to get the uh, appropriate hot air to some of those leading edges in the engine to prevent um, ice from accumulating on there, potentially breaking off and then fodding out the engines. Increased stall margin, uh, again, not really used anymore, but uh, essentially it's going to keep your nozzles open about 5% more uh, to reduce the uh, chances of getting a compressor stall in that engine. So same throttle. One thing I forgot to mention on the other side, the uh, push to talks uh, are right here. So if you go down on it, that's gonna be your ICS. And if you go up, 
that's going to transmit on whatever uh, wafer switch you have that on. So as we discussed earlier, COM1, COM2, or COM3, that's gonna be uh, what you transmit on. Here's your flaps and slats indicator, or selector here. So that's gonna be flaps full up and slats retracted. If I wanna get the slats to extend, pull that little lever there and go to extend. And then I would look up there on the slat indicator and see it extending. Flaps half, there's a detent right there. And then flaps full is obviously at the stop. Same thing uh, that we discussed on the other side, the alter throttle. So decrease, increase for your four engines, standby pitch and normal yaw, just like we said in the other one. And then kind of two unique switches that we'll talk about here is gonna be the roll aug limiting. So there's a couple of videos that I know you can look up online and you can see the tail, um, your horizontal stab there splitting. So in most planes, it's gonna stay symmetrical in order to control climbs and dives. But in this plane, it will help us roll. So because of this, the plane is incredibly maneuverable whenever you command it to go into a left bank or a right bank. It's very, very, very responsive. And that has a lot to do uh, with that split stab in conjunction with the spoilers getting the plane moving. Your stall inhibit switch here, the three options are CEF, SIS, or OFF. So SIS and CEF basically allow you to fly closer to uh, the stall margin, the actual uh, stall margin of the aircraft. So with this plane, uh, not a plane that you can go practice uh, your traffic pattern stalls or anything like that, because if this plane were to stall, the CG is aft enough that it would be an unrecoverable um, place to be in. So you have this SIS and CEF, which will basically um, kind of dampen out some of the pilot controls and allow you to fly a lot closer to the point of an actual uh, stalling on this aircraft. So you don't potentially pull back a little too hard and get into a stall. AFC S pitch gain is not used. We always keep that a normal. And then your uh, trim set for takeoff. One of the final checks we do lining up uh, the hold short for the runway. Press that button. You're looking for the uh, green lights to illuminate TTO. And then you check up here on your spoiler and you're looking for two trailing edge up. And that lets you know that everything is set for takeoff and you are ready to go. Moving over here now is going to be uh, all of our fuel panels. So fuel panel begins here, goes all the way down, and it's all this area right here. So there's two computers uh, that we call FIGUMS, Fuel Center Gravity Management System. So this is computer two, and that's computer one, and that is in the auto position there. So these computers can be uh, in three different modes. You can be in opt cruise, normal, or set. Opt cruise is gonna move that center of gravity a little bit further aft to get some of that tail duct behind the fuselage, hopefully give you a little bit more uh, better fuel economy. Normal, it's just going to keep um, the center of gravity on target where it should be. So you can see right here, that would be the normal center of gravity for 15 wing and it's on target there. The set knob is gonna be used for different failures. So sometimes these computers can malfunction and you might wanna to go to the set knob and then you'll use this knob to basically say, hey, I wanna set the center of gravity at say 34% MAC. So you would see the uh, dial go down here to 34% and then watch the fuel transfer aft. Not something we uh, typically use though. The computers are very reliable and do uh, work most of the time. So um, this is gonna be the visual depiction of what we're talking about with the CG. So you have the forward limit, aft limit, what you want the target to be at, and then where you're actually at. So depending on the wing sweep, you can imagine that changes the center of gravity a lot. So these uh, forward and aft limit tapes will move. Uh, different wing sweeps have a much wider envelope and different wing sweeps are gonna have different targets that you want to be at. So going down one more is gonna be the gross weight. So currently the plane we're sitting on weighs 348.6 thousand pounds and has a total fuel of 158. 0.6 thousand pounds on board. So we like to manage this uh, a lot. So when you're on a long duration flight, fuel becomes uh, really important, especially when your nearest divert base is 1,000, 1,500 miles away. You wanna make sure you're staying on top of how much fuel you have and how much fuel you're burning and how much fuel you expect to get to the next point with. And that's exactly how we do that there. Going down one more, 
this is going to be how we manage all of our tanks. So you have two main tanks that you can see, left main, right main. Those are going to stay open all the time because we obviously want to make sure um, that the main tanks which feed our engines are as full as they can be. So you can see here, they each have just over 10,000 pounds in them. And the way it works here in the B1, so the number one fuel tank is the most forward, number two is just behind that, number three is slightly aft, and number four is all the way aft. Your two left and right uh, wing tanks, and then your forward and intermediate for this switch, and your aft stores bay tank. So this here is the fill valves, and this is how you control um, if fuel is going to get into that tank. So if you keep it closed like they all are now, there's no fuel uh, that's gonna be getting into any of those tanks. Here you have uh, corresponding with the switches, so you can see two and three, two and three, that's how much fuel's in there right now. So uh, number two, you're looking at about 34, 35,000 pounds of gas in it. Your wings, one and four, and then your mains, like I said. Down here we have the transfer pumps. So if we wanna transfer fuel out of tank number three, two, left and right, or one and four. You can turn these pumps on and then you'll see a corresponding light. So for number four, that light would come on letting you know that that transfer pump is activated. Not something we typically have to do, but in the uh, event that you're having center of gravity issues and say uh, your center of gravity is moving a little bit more aft than you would like, you can get fuel out of number four, put it into the forward most fuel bay tank and hopefully get that center of gravity to move forward and be in a better regime. Right next to that is gonna be the crossfeed switch. So this is gonna be between your left and right main. If it's open, the two will be feeding each other. If it's closed, the systems will be working independently of each other. Down here is your ballast tank isolation valve. So uh, the best way to describe this one is in a uh, weapons employment scenario. Say you're gonna be releasing uh, eight 2,000 pound bombs out of the uh, aftmost bay. That's gonna be 16,000 pounds of bombs coming off the jet. So you're gonna to wanna to transfer some fuel from the forward most to the aft most and keep that CG within limits. You don't want 16,000 pounds just falling off the plane without some sort of uh, anticipation anticipation, and a CG shift. So a uh, normal flight will keep that open and EMUX will uh, control based off of how much fuel is in one and four and the other. It will control whether or not that tank is open or closed and something very important uh, that we typically like to keep an eye on during the flights to make sure it's in the correct position. Down here is how you will see uh, exactly how much fuel is in each tank. So you can see, uh, as I said, the mains had about 11,000 earlier. They actually get 10,700 pounds and you can do that for all the other ones when there's power on the jet. Those will flip and show you an exact readout of what's in there. Uh, right here, so this is a fuel dump, as I'm sure you saw on the walk around. This is how um, lift this red guard to switch up and flip that up, and then all these transfer pumps would come on, and that's how um, you would start to dump out fuel. We can dump out a, about a maximum of 3,800 pounds per minute, so uh, definitely something that if you're doing, you want to keep an eye on because you don't want to dump too much gas and find yourself in a bad situation. More transfer pumps here for the forward, intermediate, and aft. And then here is the uh, cooling scoop. It's normally in the auto position, so anything below 370 knots, the jet will use uh, scoops that drop down from the lower part of the uh, fuselage and just use regular old ram air to cool off the fuel. And then the ground cooling switch there uh, for ground refuel and defuel. Moving to the overhead panel, uh, this, the overhead panel up here, I would say is organized incredibly well so right here, this is gonna be uh, a lot of your lighting. So you can read Copilot, AFCS, and Indexer. So what that's gonna do is that AFCS uh, panel that we showed on the uh, kind of inside of the glare shield here, that's gonna make those lights a little bit brighter or dimmer. So all those are just a combination of different uh, lights. Your floodlights here, so there's an instrument and overhead um, floodlight, and then your pedestal inside a floodlight. If you turn these up, it's gonna get pretty bright in here for you. An aisle light during the nighttime flights, you can flip that to the uh, on position and it's gonna run for a few minutes and give you uh, some lighting in that aisle and hallway back there. Your uh, enunciators here, so all the master caution and uh, fire detection lights, everything like that, that's gonna be uh, the bright and dim. And then your normal warning uh, 
test function. So on every ground up, uh, on all the ground ups that we do, you're gonna do uh, make sure all the lights work and dim, make sure they all work and bright. And then for the overhead, you're gonna do all the same. So what you wanna do is make sure that all the lights turn on and work as appropriate. Your normal external lighting here, any collision, position, standby, flash, and then dim, bright, and off. Cabin pressure altitude, so typically uh, it's gonna be around 8,000 feet when you're up at altitude, otherwise it should read ambient. And then for here, these are our fire detector loops. So in the overwing fairing, APU, in each one of the engines, you're gonna have two coils that run around that area that if a fire were to occur, uh, the gas in there would expand and we'll, uh, a sensor would be able to say, hey, uh, it's getting hot in there. There's a uh, there's likely a fire in there. So it's redundant. You have an A and a B for each one of those. And uh, we'll test those on every ground ops to make sure that the appropriate lights are illuminated. Moving up here is gonna be our generators. So uh, as you can see, one, two, and four, Notice number three is missing. Our number three engine does not have a generator. So um, pretty self-explanatory here with the reset and off being on that top. And if you wanna flip them on, you'll just move the switches to that forward position. Uh, in some different emergency procedures, there's a constant speed drive. So uh, the best way to explain this is obviously the more fuel you put into the engine, the quicker that uh, inside of it's gonna turn but we don't necessarily want the generators to turn any faster because they have a really specific RPM they need. So they're not overproducing or underproducing power. So these constant speed drives uh, basically manage a clutch and keep the generator spinning at the same RPM all the time. Going up here is how we can check the different generators. So that would be generator one, two, three, correction, two, four, and then your emergency generator that uh, would move your volts and frequencies here. And then you can check your different buses. Think of a bus like a, uh, kind of really fancy power strip. So we have four different ones that a lot of things are plugged into. Uh, and then we have two DC ones, a forward and an aft one as well. So here's your emergency generator. In certain emergencies, uh, certain failures, this thing will automatically kick on and provide um, emergency electrical power. Obviously not as powerful um, as the three generators we have combined, but it will keep uh, some safety of flight items on. This is just your normal battery. First switch that we flip whenever we get into the cockpit. Uh, to start at the ground ops and then external power if you need it they'll plug it up you'll flip that to on and you'll start to get some of the power in there mm -hmm. so up here we have our uh, air refueling panel and these three are going to be our lighting this is going to be the uh, exterior lighting the enunciator lighting and the slipway door lighting so sometimes the tanker might ask you uh, to turn up the lighting so they can get a little bit better visual so this is where you would look to do that here we have the different modes you have an override mode and the normal mode Override mode is going to be um, the B1 uh, is the only uh, player that has the ability to disconnect the boom from the plane. Not something you uh, would really like to do. You'd like to give that boom operator a vote and whether or not uh, he can pull the boom away from the jet. But there are certain cases um, where this might be necessary. Uh, something that you definitely have to brief with the boom operator to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Another cool thing the B1 can do is reverse AR. So we can actually give fuel back to the tanker uh, if it's required, and that would just be in the reverse mode. And then you have to configure a couple more switches down with the fuel panel, and you would be reverse ARing. This is gonna be the door that opens up the, uh, opens up to the air refueling receptacle. So the air refueling receptacle on the B1 is at the nose. So you would just pull this handle down, and the door would open up, and you would basically see uh, kind of the same thing you'd see when you open up the gas uh, lid on your uh, car. Going up one more is going to be our hydraulic uh, information. So here on the top, you have quantities. Tank two and three are our biggest. They can hold uh, up to 20. And tank one and four are our smallest with holding up to 15. Pressure here is 4,000 uh, plus or minus 500. So I know most aircraft are about 3,000. Uh, I've been told in order to save some weight, they upped the PSI to 4,000 um, to do that. So then coming up here is gonna be a lot of our uh, environmental panel and some stuff to do with our defog and fuel cooling. So we'll start at the top of this panel. So right here are going to be uh, specific bleeders for each, each engine. The bleeder that we pull is from the fifth stage uh, at normal power settings. And then at a lower power setting, you might need to grab some bleeder from the ninth stage as well. So you flip all those on uh, and you're gonna be getting the normal bleeder and cooling that you want. 
right below that are going to be your air sources and these are basically going to be uh, refrigeration units so you have four different refrigeration units there's a lot of computer on here a lot of heat gets generated and uh, you want to make sure that you have some redundancy there and then this is just going to be um, how we get cooling air to the forward compartment the avionics or sorry cooling air to the crew and central avionics and then cooling air to the wheel well so normally it's going to be in the normal uh, mode there so it's going to be using um, essentially exhaust from here that gets pre-cooled goes into the refrigerators and gets cooled even further and then now is going to go into one of these uh, three compartments and take some heat away from those computers going down here um, is going to be the crew temperature so you have the auto manual hot and cold uh, to control how it feels in the crew compartment windshield uh, most of these switches are no longer in use, but the one that is, is your uh, alter, anti-ice, defog, anti-ice, and then alter, defog. So sometimes, especially going into more humid places, just like your car, the uh, windshield can fog up. And the same thing that you do in your car, you turn that defog on. And so that's going to be the uh, same thing we do here. We'll turn that defog on. Going over to this right side. So one of the interesting things that I learned uh, about going through the B course here is the way that heat is uh, kind of generated and dissipated in here. So there's a lot of computers, a lot of them are pretty old, so they're, they're gonna be like your computers that you used to have get really, really hot. And obviously that's not uh, something that you want on board of a plane that's loaded with a bunch of fuel. So what ends up happening is those computers are liquid cooled and then the liquid uh, coolant that's getting the heat from those computers is gonna get cooled by our fuel. And uh, what better way to get heat off of the B1 than to uh, heat up the fuel a little bit and then burn the fuel off. So that's how we get heat off uh, from computers and things like that, as we'll heat up uh, liquid cooling and then the fuel will take some heat from that and then the fuel will get burned. So that's what you're looking at here is gonna be the fuel cooling loop return. So in the normal position, that's basically going to direct the fuel that just got done cooling off the liquid coolant uh, to get burned. If you go to the open, that's going to allow it to go back into the main tanks. Not really used because as you can imagine, um, you don't really want to keep uh, hotter and hotter fuel on the jet. You want to get that um, off as quick as you can. Uh, down to the crossover switch here, that's going to allow the uh, left fuel cooling loop and the right fuel cooling loop to basically uh, go back and forth with each other. Again, not something we typically use. And then uh, washer reservoir is not used. Unfortunately, uh, we're not able to clean our windshield off like you can in your car. And then pitot heat uh, stays in the, uh, it's essentially, I know it says off, but it's the normal position. Uh, so once specific parameters are met, the uh, pitot heat will automatically turn off. And then once you're landing, the pitot heat will uh, kick off on its own. I think that's it. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did There's awesome. a ton of stuff. Captain Cameron Sorrells, hope you guys uh, enjoyed a tour of the cockpit of the B-1. Uh, I'm Staff Sergeant Joel Macklett. I'm a DCC of Aircraft 86095, um, and I've been working the B-1 for the past four years. So here we're going to be looking at the nose radome real quick. Um, it weighs approximately 300 pounds, and it houses our LOA, our low observable antenna. You, can, you might be able to see on there, we have a couple of their lightning strips. They come, there's one, uh, I believe three on top, couple on the sides and we have three on the bottom here it's just extra protection against the uh, against the elements here so we have our Doppler radar here and as we go back further we're looking at these four circles that say do not paint they are our, our radar altimeters and if we look to the sides of those they're covered currently there are uh, there are angle of attack and then we have our pedo tubes directly above those We'll come further back here now, looking at our smux vein. Um, it moves approximately, it can move at a maximum of 200 degrees a second, and it's plus or minus 20 degrees there. And from the smux vein, we'll look into the nose gear here, the wheel well, and we can see that as the nose gear swings up, we have tire bump stops up on this side. Uh, so as the tires are spinning, as it takes off from the ground, uh, they land into those and stop. This other side here, we have our aerial refueling accumulator and our nose landing gear emergency extend accumulator, the one on the right. 
that's in case of an emergency and the landing gear is not extending it'll basically drop the landing gear out if they can't get it to ex gravity extend it'll use the nitrogen spot nitrogen pressure that's stored there to pop it out um, this jet has just gone through a wash actually so that's why that junction box up there is still covered in barrier paper and tape to make sure it doesn't get wet we're not going to experience any issues or electrical issues there as we come further forward or further back uh, we're looking at the nose landing gear strut, the landing lights, and the taxi light. If they use the landing lights, all three of these lights here will be on. And if they're using just a taxi light, just a taxi light turn on. From there, we're going to look at the nose wheel steering gearbox. It's along this backside. We have a service engage along the backside that we check on our 2A inspection right there. It is hard to see sometimes, so you need a flashlight and get in there real close. Make sure you can check that the nose wheel steering gearbox is serviced and ready to go. It's what allows the nose, wheels, nose landing gear to steer. Um, in, so there's a switch upstairs that you've probably seen. It's a taxi and landing switch. Up here, we have an alert start and APU stop switch here. And that is for if we are in alert status, we'll have the jet set ready to go. And you just come out, you run, you punch the button, the APUs will start if, as long as all the switches upstairs are sweat, uh, set properly. Um, and then you have an APU stop switch just in case you need to stop them from the ground if you're not upstairs or the person upstairs is unable to stop them. We also have our, our stair ladder right here. We have a stair ladder up, a uh, electrical option and you basically you switch the flip and you flip it up and the stair ladder will raise from the ground there's also a way to do it mechanically and electrically from upstairs and we also have our gravity extend for the stair uh, stair ladder 129 uh, that is the aircraft tail number uh, it is currently our wing jet and it is one of the more Hmm, that's how do I say this? I'd say it's one of the better jets in the fleet. Uh, tends to have a couple hydro problems, but that's about it. Other than that, she flies pretty good. We have the tires, they're serviced to 210 PSI uh, all the time. They're never not at that. We're gonna take a step back further here. We're gonna, already talked about the stair ladder. We have three modes or three ways to extend it. We have a mechanical, electrical, and then a gravity extend, and a couple of ways to do that. The mechanical uh, extend and retract is actually gonna be right here. It says crew entry ladder up and down. Just grab a speed handle and you turn it until it starts moving. It's pretty easy, actually. We'll come back further to the weapons bay. We have a stores bay tank loaded. It's our 180 inch tank. It holds just over 19,000 pounds of fuel, which is more than most jets hold, or most fighter jets hold just on their own. Uh, so it's, it, it helps with our range and capability as a bomber, especially when we're going on these uh, longer uh, missions. Come back further. All the weapons bays, we have three of them. They're all very similar. Uh, we can put fuels bay tanks in all of them if required. So that gives us an extra almost uh, 60,000 pounds of fuel. I've only ever seen these, uh, the forward and mid-bay tanks loaded. The aft one will usually have a weapons mod in it, so an 8x, 10x, or 28x. If we look at the aft of the mid-bay, or yeah, the mid-bay, we have our torque tubes for the slats, the flaps, and then the wings in that order. So the slats on top, we have the flaps in the middle, and then we have the wings on the bottom. The wings are the thickest torque tube. It's the biggest moving uh, flight surface. Um, speaking of the wing sweep currently, if we look at, we call it the football panel right here. Underneath that panel, we have the ball screw actuator, and that can experience anywhere from 500,000 pounds of force under tension and around 450,000 pounds under compression as it sweeps the wings back and forward. If we come back to the, just behind the mid bay, or yeah, the mid intermediate weapons bay, we have our aft band eight and aft band seven radars or antenna. And those are required to be checked on our 2A inspections as well for any delamination or anything of those sorts. Um, as we're here, we're gonna switch over to the main landing gear. <clears throat> 
The tires are serviced to 250 PSI, and then if the, uh, gross, the gross weight of the aircraft is over 360,000 pounds, sorry, um, we have to up the servicing to 275 PSI. Whether that be on a cold or hot day, it's always 275. We can come in and look at the brakes. Brakes are controlled by hydraulic systems two and three. Um, and they will be utilized up to 2800 PSI with normal operating pressures from both systems. And in case one system fails, they will potentially use up to an entire full system's pressure to apply brakes or to apply the pistons on the brakes. Four for each, they're back there as well. We have four up front, four in the back, and then op uh, same on the opposite gear. Um, it's in case if we lose hydraulic pressure on one end of it, that fuse will stop any more uh, loss of hydraulic fluid and still allow us to use that brake. So we come back just a hair further. We have the main landing gear strut itself, which is serviced on every pre-flight and made to match, match on each side as long as they're serviced to the appropriate PSI. Up here, I'm actually going to... So if we look right here, this is the manual for the main landing gear doors to open them. So as the plane lands uh, upstairs, they don't have a way to drop the doors. So it has to be done from the nose. And if they don't get dropped after it lands and pushed back on the spot, we have to come up here with a ratchet and a half inch socket and manually open our landing gear doors. It just actuates these, it pushes them back and allows our doors to drop down. While I'm up here, Climb up a little bit further. And here, this is our emergency brake selector valve. It has an open and close on it. Some of them aren't labeled, but down is closed. And when we're doing our toes, we have to set the switch upstairs to emergency brake. It'll switch this automatically up to open. And then it allows us to get, I wanna say nine to 11 applications on our brakes using the accumulators that we use to start our APUs. Um, then we have our axle beam positioner, which is this right here. Make sure the axle beam is positioned properly on landing and takeoff. And when it tucks back up in, it'll be all nice and snug. Let's see, all that's that. Underneath the panels on the side here, we have our large PCAs. So they have a ton of circuit breakers on them for basically everything on the aircraft back here. Um, we have a couple of central circuit breakers upstairs, but most of our uh, circuit breakers and PCAs are back here underneath these panels here. As we come back further, we're looking at the aft bay. And in order to, currently the doors are at 45 degrees because we just washed the aircraft. So we have the 45 so we can get a proper cleaning on each side of the doors. And in order to do that, it's usually a manual process. Underneath, there's a little flathead, little access panel right here very very small um, and you open that up you grab a speed handle and an extension and you get to sit there and spin it for approximately usually takes like 10 to 15 minutes it's roughly to get it to 45 it's roughly 800 800 turns or so on that speed handle to get it to this position you can also uh, manually or technically it's electronically open and close them from these back panels here Right here, we have a couple of switches in there and one of them will open and close the aft bay. One is for the light in the aft as well. We also, in order to close these, we have to mechanically desafe it. And this is this red handle that you can be, can be seeing on each of the bays. It's harder to see because the doors are 45, but it's a mechanical disconnect for the doors so they cannot move this lever is down. So we make sure it's when you go to open it and close it, we have to close that handle and then make sure it's clear before we move it. Come back just a little further. We're going to be looking at... We have a couple more antenna back here. This is changed. We have aft band 7 and 8 back here as well. And then we also have our equipment bays back here, which is underneath this big panel and this other big panel. And that just houses a bunch of our DAS equipment even further. We have our aft radome, which is similar to the nose radome, approximately the same weight 
Um, it just houses a bunch of antennas and uh, transmitters for our DAS equipment. We also have, continuing on the DAS side of things, we have our TDS, which is our towed decoy system. It's just another countermeasure in case of an opposition uh, launching a threat at us. We have one on each side. So we look at the inlets on our General Electric F101 engines here. Uh, we have these, they're called movable cowling lips, cowling lips, your MCLs. And so a below Mach 0.33, they'll be full open at 90 degrees. And then once they get to Mach 0.33, they'll close to zero degrees. And then as soon as they get above Mach 0.66, they'll close 10 degrees in to ensure that the airflow is the proper. If they're, if they're getting too much air, it risks, risks compression stalls. So we try and make sure those are working properly because if not, then we can't go too fast. We can't get that mock. Along the nacelle, we have our fire bottles in case of an emergency. We have a gauge in there to make sure they're serviced. We have one there. And we have one above it as well. It's the same on the other side. We also have our control for the overwing fairing. This switch here allows it to, you can move it up and down as long as you have accumulated pressure and your batteries are on. And then we also have two more fire bottles up in the OAF and those are controlled by the uh, FWEP upstairs, the fire warning extinguishing panel. We can, let's see what else, what else? What's that? Talked about that, the wings, the wing sweep. Uh, the wing sweeps, uh, full back is 67 and a half degrees, and that changes our wingtip to wingtip uh, span from 137 feet to just 73 feet. It makes us have a lot smaller cross section. Hi. Hello, my name is Staff Sergeant Klein. I work with the 28th Munition Squadron. Our job is to store maintain, assemble, and deliver the munitions needed to support the B-1's mission. This first trailer here is some of our more conventional munitions. And both these trailers have an assortment of munitions that show the different types of missions we can support with the B-1. On this trailer, we have a cluster bomb unit alongside another assortment of JDAMs. A cluster bomb unit is a bomb made up of many smaller bombs. Essentially, when this is dropped from the aircraft, the outer shell splits apart and smaller BLU submunitions are dispersed. Different BLUs have different missions and one of the coolest ones that I think is the Bluey 108. And what that is, is it's basically a skeet disc of death. What will happen is this CBU 103 will split apart and smaller submunitions will come out and before they hit the ground, they'll stop and hover. These hovering discs can shoot out shaped charges to destroy vehicles and uh, enemy material. And they're just really cool to watch. I, I recommend looking at a video of them sometime. They're just awesome. These other three over here are what are called joint direct attack munitions. And what they are essentially is they are older bombs from our stockpile, Mark 80 series and penetrators that have been converted with, spe with special tail kits to become precision guided munitions. One of these bombs can be dropped into a 50 gallon barrel from miles up in the air. In fact, one of our main tactics for penetrating a bunker is to drop a penetrator JDAM in first and then drop a second bomb through the hole that the first penetrator has created. They are just that accurate. Um, these bombs are customizable. The JDAMs are. They're customizable and they're built to order based on the mission. We have a, an assortment of different fuses, penetrator fuses. We have void sensing devices to detect which floor a munition needs to explode on. We can build whatever is needed for the mission. If we move to our next trailer, we have what's called a joint air to surface standoff missile. These are two AGM 158s of different uh, variants. One of them is a Lorazm, which is a long range anti ship missile, and the other one is a replica of an AGM 158 Bravo extended range JASM. So, what these are, are these are extended range cruise missiles that give our crews the ability to engage targets from hundreds of miles away. One of our B-1s can hold 24 of these. 
eight on three separate rotary launchers in each bay that rotate and fire them continuously. One of these missiles can travel hundreds of miles to hit a target far out of sight. And they give us versatility, long range strike capabilities, and they also protect our air crew and let them strike targets from well out of their range. Um, these munitions basically turn this B-1 into a flying Swiss Army knife. There are, we have so many different capabilities and so many different munitions for different missions that whatever comes at us, we're ready because we have the capability to perform a variety of tasks. If there are TACPs downrange, we can provide, provide close air support. If we need to take out air defenses from hundreds of miles away, we can do that before the main force arrives. It's what has created, it's what makes the B-1 such sort a of versatile platform, is how much we can do with it. If we want to make a mixed load of long-range missiles and close air support, we can. If we want to strike a target six levels down in the building, we can. Honestly, and it, um, it just makes me feel good because what we can do is what makes our enemies think twice before they try anything. Going back to these JDAMs, um, so like I said, they're just, they're just dumb bombs that have had components strapped onto them that turn them into a smart weapon. So this thing by itself is just like a bomb that you'd use in World War II or Vietnam. You literally just drop it, it explodes. But when you attach this tail kit to it, this tail kit has GPS-aided inertial navigation. And what it can do is it can hit a target, pinpoint through windows, in the barrels, through holes, from miles up in the air, as I said before. It's incredible what we can do with modern technology. This JDAM in particular is a GBU-54, and on the front, not only can it be GPS navigated, on the front, it has a laser guidance system. It has a uh, DSU-38 on the front that allows it to also be lased in by other aircraft. So you have two guidance sets on one bomb. And this is with, this is turning a, a piece of metal into a magic bullet. Um, over here we have a 2,000 pound class JDAM, a GB31 version one, that uses a Mark 84 series bomb body. This is what we use to bust uh, softer bunkers, softer uh, buildings, softer material. It can be loaded with a variety of different fuses, and it uses a uh, KMU-556. To the left of it is a 2,000 pound class penetrator called a GBU-31 version 3. And what this does is it's meant to get into those hard to reach places, those concrete bunkers underground. It uses a Bluey 109 2,000 pound penetrator, and it's outfitted with a hardback assembly to allow it to better interface with the jet. Um, it, it essentially is the, uh, excuse me, it essentially is the GB31, but harder and designed to penetrate uh, concrete. So as a munitions troop, safety is a priority. Nothing we do is arbitrary. Everything we do is outlined in a technical order, which is a manual that tells us exactly how and, uh, and what precautions we need to take in order to do our job safely. To assemble these, we have what's called a crew chief who will get together a team and they will line up on a munitions assembly conveyor where bombs will be loaded and components will be lined up and teams will work together to bring the munition together. During this time, strict housekeeping standards are met where a crew chief will enforce safety regulations and ensure that policy is being followed to the letter. These bombs are extremely dangerous, not only because they explode, but they can literally crush you. So it's important to always be vigilant. And that's what the leadership of the 28 months drives. They say that we're an airline without munitions, but we're also like a tiger without teeth, without our bombs. Our thoroughness and our diligence is what keeps those teeth sharp. We need to pay attention to what we're doing and make sure that we are following all guidelines. Otherwise, it can mean critical mission failure. On these JDAMs, not aligning a sensor could mean missing a target. Not applying a FOD free kit could mean that debris could be stuck in the engine and it could down a plane or kill a crew. So it's very important in our career field to be diligent, thorough, and hardworking. And I'm proud to say that the people that I serve with are all three. Um, and I feel like our mission here really does make a difference because the capability that we give the B1 through our hard work 
is what allows this platform to be so, so successful and so enduring. And even with the B-21 going on, um, I feel that the, the B-1 will have a place in the Air Force for years to come. Well, hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed my presentation on our months. Thank you.